Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversant is Will Spencer, who is the founder and head honcho of Renaissance of Men. He is a man with a peculiar journey through various sorts of spiritual seeking and world traveling, and he came upon Christianity and, as the saying goes, had a born-again Jesus into his heart moment. And now he works to speak about Christian virtues, specifically tailored to men. In this conversation, we cover a lot of theological and virtual territory. And by virtual, I was trying to do a word play on virtue and virtual. So if you didn't get that subtext, I'll just lay it out there right in the open. And I found him to be a very articulate man, a very sincere individual. And you can find him via his socials linked in the description below. Without further ado, here is Will Spencer. Hello. Howdy. Sorry about the wait there. There was a miniature disaster I had to take care of on the family front. Good. It was a miniature disaster and not a full-size disaster. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I won't get into what the disaster was, but it was okay. an oversized disaster, but it was miniature in the scale of things. Oh, got it. Okay. How's it going? Good. How are you? You can see me, right? My camera's on? Yeah, I can see it Perfect. really clearly. Great. What camera are you using? It's a Lumina 4K webcam. Ooh. It's very Did nice. you get this for like COVID or for? Uh, for my own podcast. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, podcasts are like herpes. Um, everybody's <laughs> like, it, they're just spreading. Just yeah. like, how did you get, how did you contract yours? Well, I started mine back uh, in, in uh, 2020. So like September of 2020 is when I started it. So, um, um, I, I started my podcast just because I, I, I had been very blessed by uh, the discussion about masculinity and its purpose in modern society. Uh, and I had encountered so many different creators who were talking about it. I wanted to highlight the different creators hmm. um, who were doing that. So that's, that's why I started it. It became something very different over time. Yeah. A showcase of guys. That was, it was sort of like a gallery of the way that different kind of men were thinking about masculinity and then over time it became increasingly christianized as i became increasingly christianized oh, okay yeah a, yeah. a gal a gallery <laughs> no <laughs> sure why not yes you can actually okay, hear the I evolution heard, <laughs> yeah, the I dad jokes are just like no, i think it's, it's our propel right it's okay great. i haven't i haven't heard that one before so yeah that's great hmm I've, I've been uh, in the gender discourse. Well, I've, I've been in the gender uh, thing for, uh, I don't know, a really Your long life. time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it came upon me when I was 14 pretty strongly, you know, but uh, you know, with the different feelings that uh, arose at that time. Um, but specifically in what we call discourse or in the modern sure. discourse, gender has been kind of a staple uh, exploration. Mm-hmm. I mean, because it's very human, uh, it's moral, it's the intersection of politics and the personal, um, Mm -hmm. and then the personalities uh, that, uh, and the ethics Mm -hmm. that are involved in what it is to be a man, Mm -hmm. not just like, what is a woman, but what is it to be a woman? What is it to be a man? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's rich, very rich stuff. Yes. Very complicated. There's been lots of change over time in both of those and not necessarily not necessarily good or productive or healthy ways also no Mm -mm. you don't think so Mm -mm. no i don't think so at all is who's to blame for that uh yes (laughs) (laughs) good there we go i like this already i mean it's it's it uh is this uh, are we recording right now or is this like pre-game it's it felt like we were uh we're already in it okay i just wanted to make sure i wasn't sure so yeah i'm happy to answer that question um um, so who's, you said who's to blame, right? That that's what you were wondering. Yeah. Mm. It's a loaded question. I know, but it's a, it's a super loaded question. I mean, it, you can, you can go back as far, you can go all the way back to the, um, the French revolution. If you wanted to, um, you can go back to the industrial revolution. You can go to the communist revolution. Those three shifts were probably some of the most, hmm. uh, some of the most significant in, uh, in upending, the um the biblical gender norms the descri- the description of who men and women are and what we're for rebellion oh. against uh rebelling against god's created order so those probably those three 
I mean, it's it's arbitrary when you start it. Probably the French Revolution is was the first objective strike on um, on hmm. uh, say biblical thinking in the West. So um, by biblical thinking, it's not just directly translated or uh, derived from the Bible, but I'm thinking if you're talking about the French Revolution, you're talking about masculinity in the West, and I hear overtures of chivalry and the the Christianization of uh, Europe and the standards and the roles that were exhibited at that time based on biblical authority, but you know, uh, sieved through the cultural lens of, you know, medieval Europe. Sure. So uh, a big unknown participant in the, um, in the French revolution was a man named Marquis de Sade. And uh, Marquis de Sade was one of the thinkers who contributed to inspiring it uh, in many ways. And he was just a pure depraved maniac and he had no regard for the bodies of either men or women. And um, I think it was, uh, was it Sartre? Sartre was talking about how Jean-Paul Sartre how was, was talking about how in the 20th century, he because that's when he wrote about it, that it was very clear that um, the French revolutionaries of the time were actively trying, in the execution of the king, were actively trying to kill God's representative on earth, because that was the mm. conception of the monarchy, was that you know the, yeah. the, the monarch was God's appointed ruler over French society, and they wanted to kill God's appointed ruler and bring about a more quote unquote democratic kind of view. So there's the issue of cultural Christianity, which is like, how does Christianity and Christian teachings manifest in our society and how we interact as individuals? There's that, but there's also the conception of God and Christianity and God's law and how we organize a society overall. So you can, you can shift an overall society's perspective to, uh, on, um, how do we as a civilization relate to God and receiving his law while not removing Christianity entirely from culture at the same time? Does that mm-hmm. make sense? So some mm-hmm. of these chivalric ideas, of course, they're, they're still there. But when you, compl- when you say we're going to kill God's representative on earth and we're going to institute a new rule of law based entirely in man, that shift can happen basically overnight and lead to chaos, even if you still have you know, chivalric uh, kind of values in and amongst the people, but the French revolutionaries themselves, like Marquis de Sade and others, absolutely did not hold them. Hmm. It's a kind of gilded man that they're talking about, like because you're, you're talking about humanism. It's it's a it's a, almost like a sexless creature, this this rational agent. That right? that came later. Um, that that definitely uh, that was how the industrial revolution kind of played into things. Um, once man became um, a cog in an economic machine, what the French Revolution was more focused on was the liberation of, of sexuality. Uh, so it wasn't that they became, you said gilded man. Did you mean gelded, like like a gelded horse kind of thing? Yeah, or gelded. gelded like, yeah. Gelded, okay. So, yeah. that, so the French Revolution, Marquis de Sade, was more about liberating sexuality, you know, to have a sort of lic- licentious behavior. The gelding came a little bit, came a little bit later. Yeah. Gelding is in, uh, not gilded as in everything I touch turns to gold, but gelded as in everything I touch kind of troops down. Yes, exactly. Castrating. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So why the liberation of sexuality? And what's the, what's the consequence of liberating sexuality? Well, so what's being liberated isn't necessarily everybody's sexuality. Um, not, not right away. What's being liberated first is women's sexuality from the family. So rather than uh, you know childbearing, reproduction, being confined from one woman to one man for life, instead, her you know and, and being given to this husband, right, and being and being a, a gift to bring life into the world, it becomes a source of uh, purely personal pleasure and and fun and exploration that becomes available to all men. So the first thing that gets liberated is women's sexuality. And then you have all of this supply, right? You might say that then it goes looking for a demand. And so the demand comes from the men and the men get liberated from marriage as well. And then years later, 150 years later, no less than that, you have um, the sexual revolution in the United States in the 1960s. So the French revolution began that process that then manifested fully in full flower in the United States. I don't know. Was that a hundred years later, 150 years later, something like that. I don't mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. 
Well, the sexual revolution uh, spurred on by the liberation of women from fertility. Yes. Right, right. But the um, ideas preceded that, the ideas of sexual libertinism. Yes. Oh, very much. Very, very much. So you started seeing this coming around in the 1920s during the jazz age. Uh, you had a lot of that really kind of bubbling up in the 1950s as well. But of course, the invention of the birth control pill or the release of the birth control pill anyway in the 1960s really brought that into full flower in American culture. But the sexual revolution itself, the idea of it came from a man named Wilhelm Reich, R-E-I-C-H. Oh, He's, yeah, yeah. The orgasmic energy or the organ. Yes, that's him. Yeah. yeah, he's considered the father of the sexual revolution. That's his formerly what he's acknowledged. And the sexual revolution in his conception was a continuing manifestation of the communist revolution. That was why he created the sexual revolution, because he felt that any societal revolution uh, towards communism that didn't also include sexuality was incomplete. And he tried to convince Stalin of that and was largely unsuccessful because the consequences were too great. But he did succeed ultimately in convincing Americans. Um, the consequences of what? Why would Stalin uh, say ex ne? Too much chaos. That. Too much okay. chaos. Because if you're trying to create a, a sort of a command and control society, which is what communism is, and you have a sexual chaos, it's impossible to do. It rips the family apart. Um, it rips apart the ability for a society to be productive enough to be able to produce resources for everybody because everyone's just being sexually licentious all the time. So Stalin was like, this is a bridge too far, even though he mm -hmm. recognized that it, it was necessary. It was a bridge too far and led to far too much documented chaos in the Soviet Union in the first half of the 20th century. So the okay. ideas were ultimately exported to the United States in the 1950s through Kinsey and then took full flower following Wait, Kenzie, uh, well, you're throwing so much. I'm sorry. Yeah, Thank sorry. You. <laughs> this is great. This is great. I, I, I love I've studied it. this quite a bit. Well, what do you, what are the ties between Kinsey and the ideological strain of communism, etc.? So, like oh, okay. So not Kinsey. necessarily communism uh, for Kinsey, although possibly it was the idea. It was the idea that um, sexual revolution was necessary to create a societal revolution. Um, and so Kinsey was a participant in that with uh, documenting the supposed various sexual practices of America, Americans, many of whom were quite degenerate and his methods were um, shady to say the least. And that's come mm. out recently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the sexologist or the scientific view on studying sex takes a almost, well, a rather inhuman or attempted un inhuman objective lens. And it doesn't have, it sees sex as valueless. So we can go in there and manipulate the genitals of whoever he wants to, because he's just studying <laughs> right. this thing. It, 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 it's valueless. So it's just interesting that the Kinseyan uh, sexologist study of sex as a valueless just exchange. It's like, what is this thing? How does it function? Is also being tied in what you're laying out from this very small point of view. It's also tied to a communist value-laden um, engineering of sexual mores or, mm -hmm. or, push, or understanding that sex can't be valueless. Yes. Sex is a deeply moral act. And to pretend otherwise... Um, dishonors it and dishonors the participants. Mm. Sex is a inherently moral act. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Um, Why? Perhaps one of well, it's just a biological function. Gnats do it. Bees do it. Educated fleas do it. <laughs> Educated. Sure. So just because um, just because something is natural doesn't immediately uh, remove it from the moral equation. So especially because you have, hum we're not talking about gnats and bees, we're talking about humans and humans are, are moral actors. We have the ability to choose right and wrong and we know, and we have a conscience hmm. which tells us right and wrong. So uh, especially with regard to an act that can literally bring life into, uh, into creation, I guess you might say, bring life into existence that makes it a deeply moral act. Um, and so we're not like bees or dogs or gnats we are imbued with a conscience and an immortal soul that makes this act in, inherently moral. So, but what Kinsey and uh, Wilhelm Reich 
and what many others like them were trying to do was they recognized that sexuality was such a powerful motivator for people. And so if we can, um, if we can, and the French revolutionaries recognize this as well, if we can upend sexual mores in the culture, we can tip the entire culture on its head. And so that's what Wilhelm Reich recognized in the sexual revolution being part, in his mind, part of the communist revolution. That was ultimately, again, unsuccessful in the Soviet Union, uh, and it was imported to the United States. And the way that it began entering to the United States, as it often does, is through quote unquote science. And so if you go looking into uh, Alfred Kinsey's studies and you see um, the behavior of some of his participants, um, you can pretty much discern, as has, as has been shown, that uh, we'll say the abuse of children was part of his study as well. So Kinsey was not a, was not a moral man, was not, studying, uh, was not studying things from a position of blessing, but a position of upending American culture. And then he and Reich uh, were ultimately successful, not alone, but they were successful in the 1960s. Once the introduction of the pill came around, that was part of it. Uh, and then No Fault Divorce was another one. So I just want to slow down on this. Kinsey yeah. had the intention you've seen, or it's documented that he had the intention of anything other than just studying or oh, even yeah. getting his rocks off. So he wanted, he had a social program informing him. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. And how, how absolutely. was that com communist? Do you, do you, are there anecdotes or is there explicit like I don't, I don't know that Kinsey. <clears throat> manifestos? I don't know that Kinsey's. <laughs> well, when you look at when you look at the quote, the, then he's known as the father of the sexual revolution. That is Wilhelm Reich. You can go look that up. That's on the Guardian, for example. Yeah. So the father of the sexual sexual revolution was Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich was a communist, right? Wilhelm Reich also provided the philosophical justification for Drag Queen Story Hour. And so, if you want, I can go get um, some some materials I have with direct quotes of him. So you have Wilhelm Reich. What's that? Material like you have a bin of uh, glittery gowns from Wilhelm's uh, boudoir. <laughs> no, <laughs> you I have a book right yeah, there. Yeah, you don't have to get the book. I was just yeah. Um, so um, so uh, that cites his what was his what was his sure, signature so. work? The Mass Psychology of Fascism. So the Mass Psychology of Fascism was a book that um, that students and I think French students in the 1960s were throwing at police, and it was in that uh, during their protests. And it was in that book where he, um, I believe he asserted that having sexual control over people is a manifestation of fascism. So sexual liberation became a tool of political liberation. That was Wilhelm Reich's express goal. That was what he was doing. Okay. It yeah. just, well, uh, maybe they were naive and didn't see the consequences of their theories, but these people who, Sorry, who want to, they? well, let's just say Willem, anybody who wants to upend society. No, he knew what he was doing. He well, knew yeah, exactly but what he was the, doing. The problem is like, they always say that they have like a alternative, but time and time again, an, up, uh, an upheaved society becomes tyrannical just as a, as yeah. just a response, an immune response yeah. to the chaos. No, that was, that was what they wanted. Sexual they, they liberation wanted, like, and political control. That was the purpose okay. of sexual revolution. The, the purpose of sexual liberation okay. is to engender political control. That is, it is its express purpose. I'll read you a bunch of quotes. Okay. It's just the people who are, pre, uh, who are grasping after political control invariably are preaching, libera selling liberation, and then they even want liberation. But it's always sexual about liberation power. only. Oh, okay. Sexual liberation Not only. Not economic or creative. No. Okay. No, no, no. Because because once you have people once you have people liberated from the family from sexual from from the, from, yeah. especially from the family yeah. right then you then you create an amount of societal chaos right and then that societal chaos must be controlled with increased legislation and police presence but people don't notice because they're so lost in sexual pleasure they don't notice that their civil liberties are being eroded because they're they're, they're so uh, we'll say indulgent. Okay. That's why sexual liberation was the primary tool of communism, because definitely Wilhelm Reich recognized, he was one of the first to recognize that if we liberate people sexually, then we can bring about this increased governmental control. That's his, that's his language. I'll, I'll pull, read you some quotes yeah, right please, now if you please want. Please do. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so keep, uh, I'm, I'm listening. No, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for these okay. zingers. Sure. 
Uh, let's see. I can edit that down. So but... the first thing. So if you'd like, I can read. Uh, so this is in his book, um, The Sexual Revolution, Die Sexualität in Kulturkampf, Wilhelm Reich. The carrier and cultivator of this revolution, the psychic structure of man was not qualitatively changed by the social revolution. Since the Communist Party had not formed any opinion on the sexual revolution, and since they could not master the revolutionizing upheaval of life with historical analysis of angles alone, a struggle broke out which will show all future generations the birth pangs of a cultural revolution. Lenin himself emphasized that the sexual revolution, as well as the process of social, sex social sexuality in general, had not been understood at all in the form of dialectical materialism and that it would take an enormous it would take enormous experience to master it so what reich is saying here is that um the form of dialectical materialism which is hegel right which was the foundation of marx the process of sexual revolution as well as the process of social sexuality hadn't yet been factored in to hegel's dialectical materialism it wasn't part of marxism but lenin recognized that and so then you also have this is the this is the real zinger of the quote that I think um, hopefully your people won't like. Um, this is also in the sexual uh, sexualitat in culture comp. In contrast, a child whose motor activity is completely free and whose natural sexuality has been liberated in sexual play will oppose strictly authoritarian ascetic influences. No reactionary ideology or political orientation can ever accomplish for children what a social revolution can with respect to their sexual life. We thus see the revolutionary structuring of the child must involve the freeing of his biological sexual motility. This is indisputable. So what Reich is saying here is we need to introduce children to their sexual natures so we can create a sexual revolution and bring about communism later. And that is the philosophical justifications of Drag Queen Story Hour in Wilhelm Reich. So the Queering of the American Child, which is a book by Logan Lansing and uh, James Lindsay that details the infiltration of queer theory, so-called, throughout the American education system, they... Um, they document that, they show it as a cult, and they also heavily say that this is a factor of the communist revolution, that right. if you engender gender and sex as early as possible in the kids, they are destabilized in a number of different ways. And then you can, you can stack up higher order uh, levels of control by giving them over to lower level um, obsessions, sexual Right. That's everything I'm saying. Okay. Perfect. So that you're in, in essence, hijacking like that mm, scene in the matrix where the guys are all plugged in like batteries into the great, you know, the, what, what's it called? The, the matrix, like your, your higher mm -hmm. order individualism or individual rational agent self that can make decisions that can structure life, that can pursue the good, the true and the beautiful is is not accessed and you're not able to develop that because you're stuck at a lower animalistic level chasing treats um getting yeah. off you know and never getting them turning on in the bigger larger sense to life never developing never developing moral discipline chastity right modesty um, sexual sexual continence yeah exactly okay and so that that necessitates a greater degree of social control when you have a populace being governed by the, governed by their passions. Okay. And what's the point of the social control from your point and, of view? And power. Power is its own power is its own end. Okay. Power over what though? Power over seething mass of, you know, orgiastic again another scene from the matrix ironically enough, uh, enough just right. a bunch of raving uh, idiots in a cave basically like Yeah. What kind of power is that? I mean, power, power is its own end. Okay. You know, men and women desire power because they want to be gods. Okay. Right. If there's no God above us, then we need a God here on earth. And why shouldn't that be? Why shouldn't that be me? Okay. If I have the will to do it. And that's where you get Nietzsche and all that stuff. Yeah. So, so the will to power is a real thing. It's just disconnected from, from any higher notion of service. Okay. So that laid out the question that I've been waiting to ask is that if you go back to the French Revolution and the beheading of the king, it's also a beheading of God and a beheading of the father. 
and I've mm -hmm. had a lot of discussions around political theory on my show about monarchism, about democracy, about oligarchy. And in America, from the American point of view, I don't see us electing a king or going back under a, un uh, a purely hierarchical structure unless it's bottom up, which means that there would be fathers and mothers, you know, in, in a chain of service from the very bottom to the very top. Mm -hmm. And so the question being, from your point of view, where did fatherhood fail? Or was is this attack on fatherhood as well as an attack on God? And is the solution or the uh, reaction to this properly situated in masculinity somehow? And is masculinity, how is masculinity defined, including fatherhood? So, so, okay, so... The first thing I want to say is it's impossible to separate an assault on uh, manhood and, and masculinity. It's impossible to separate that from an assault on God uh, because uh, God is God is male. God is not a man. Well, God came to earth as a man, the God man, that would be Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, but God is God is male. God is so overwhelmingly, overpoweringly male that all of creation is is um, feminine in response in compare in comparison. Mm. So men are, um, uh, are God's authorities on earth in, in the, in, in the home primarily, right? You see this structure of authority from God to Christ, to husband, to wife, to children. That's the, that is the authority structure. So when you strike at, uh, and that's the biblical authority structure. So when you strike at men, you strike at God and you strike at the family, right? Okay. So, so your question is, um, Sorry, you had a bunch of questions. Where do you want me to go with that? Authority. Said, Define authority mm -hmm. and why that is inherently male or masculine. Well, so authority itself is not in, well, hierarchy um, is built into reality. I don't know that I could say, I'd have to think it through whether authority is inherently masculine, but hierarchy is, is part of reality, okay. right? And so we have a, a biblical chain of authority, which goes from, uh, from God to Christ, to man, to woman, to children. That's the, that's the chain. Now, hierarchy doesn't imply superiority or inferiority. That's where a lot of Americans get hmm. very mixed up. Hmm. Just because someone is not necessarily on the same level hierarchically doesn't mean that you are inferior. So if you think in your workplace, right, when you go to work, do you consider yourself inferior to your boss? Not necessarily, right? Is, uh, you know, is a player on the team inferior to the coach? You know, is the left tackle inferior to the quarterback? No, the team functions as it does as a whole and all the pieces are necessary. And so this is one of the parts where Americans get very tripped up because we hear hierarchy and imagine that someone at a higher level on the hierarchy is somehow superior to us in some innate way. That's not necessarily the case. Um, and so I can I can go further with that. No, that, that's a really interesting point. And it's a... Um... I think it's a huge sticking point and maybe where this uh, tendency towards communist revolution or communist re uh, upsetting of society and then the implementation of an equitizing everybody's flat, but there's a few people completely controlling a flat landscape comes Correct. from. It's just this uh, inability to distinguish hierarchy from value or saying with the whole IQ debate and race, which is a really contentious topic, um, the just the whole metrics around IQ it, and race is just liberals and a lot of like you know elite people or people who want to be in touch with the elite can't touch that because we can't distinguish between cognitive ability and inherent value. We can't yeah. distinguish between difference and uh, capacity as opposed to this kind of notion, which I think is kind of Christian uh, notion of uh, inherent value. Right. But a perverted communism, in a sense, is a perverted form of Christianity insofar as it tries to equitize value by making it, making everybody equal in every domain of life. It's like, it's a purely equitizing impulse that is a kind of a Gnosticization of Christianity or like a reprocessing of Christianity through the human will. I would say, I would say, I, th I think communism is, is explicitly anti-Christian. Um, because it, it denies any notion of, of hierarchy and tries to make hmm. us all um, all identical. It doesn't value Identity. difference. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't value God's created differences. It can't it can't process things hierarchical, hierarchically, except as you said, 
it, it makes us into a two-tier society. So it's ultimately hmm. disastrously hierarchical in the sense that you have a very small, quote unquote, upper class or the elites presiding over the mass of humanity. And there's no ability to travel up and down the classes at all. You're locked into a, into a, a class-based prison. And you see this, you see this show up in, is it um, Fahrenheit, not at four Fahrenheit, 451, it's Brave New World. And you see how far a technocratic society is willing to go to equalize everything. And then you have, of course, the people at the very, very top and everyone else is kind of crippled below them. Hmm. So I wouldn't say that it's, it's Christian in nature because it tries to eliminate differences. It tries to homogenize rather than celebrate differences and properly organize them. Hmm. So, uh, but what it does do is it does take something that I think is true, um, which is that we all do have innate value. There is a sense in which we are all equal of equal value made in the image of God, but then it, it, it assigns that value as coming from the government, that the government gives us that value. Mm. And it, 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 that is not government's function at all is to give us value. We have innate value. Okay. So, um, thank you again. And, uh, to the audience, uh, thanks for indulging us in this kind of scattershot thing it, there's a lot of roiling <laughs> ideas going on here but authority, from zero to 60 real fast yeah <laughs> i like doing that <laughs> but to go back i just i need to challenge this notion of god being inherently masculine or how does how does the category of masculinity male, male how does the category yeah. of male help us to understand god or in what way are we deriving evidence of god or a vision of god through the lens the category of male. Where, where does this male category come from? God only exclusively refers to himself as a male. God the Father exclusively refers to himself in male terms, never refers to himself. And the authors of the Bible uh, only refer to God in male terms. And he only refers to himself in male terms, never in female terms, and never as an it. Even the Holy Spirit is referred to in, as a he. Hmm. So God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all referred to using masculine using masculine pronouns, never, never gender neutral, uh, never it and never she. Yeah. But couldn't that just be derived from the limitations of human uh, understanding? I mean, why, why is that? Why is, why is somebody talking about a thing, the authority of the thing, especially if the so, thing person talking about the thing was created by the thing they're talking about? I mean, the human language, I just have to challenge if human language can sure. adequately describe that, which is far, super, far, far, far supersedes. Sure. So, um, so I, I think it would be helpful. Um, I think it'd be helpful to for your audience to know. A little, can I give them a little bit of my background? Yeah, anything. Can, yeah, can I, I love that real quick? biographical okay. stuff. Okay. So good. I, I appreciate that because um, because I worry that um, that I might be miscommunicating a little bit about about who I am. So uh, I uh, spent twenty years in the New Age, and I traveled to thirty countries, uh, more than thirty countries around the world. I'm sure you probably found me through my my post about India. I think that's probably mm -hmm. how we mm -hmm. connected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I was born, uh, in a liberal atheist Jewish family, uh, it was bar mitzvahed. I went to Israel, went to Israel and birthright Israel. Um, but essentially atheistic. So I spent 20 years of my life searching the religions of the world, uh, objectively, like openly explicitly searching for God. And that led me to places like Peru, where I participated in ayahuasca ceremonies. I've participated in 15 ayahuasca ceremonies. I've been to uh, the Kumela Hindu festival, 190 million Hindus. And I bathe in the Ganges river upstream where it's clean, right? I've been uh, Buddhist Vipassana retreats, you know, all the different new age practices. I did that for, for 20 years. And, and why, in a, why care about this thing called God? Why, why are you motivated to find God? Uh, I guess, I guess um, there is nothing more important than truth. And um, while there are various forms of facts that we can learn, facts are only bricks that we use to build a house of truth. Hmm. And so um, what meaning could uh, the facts of material reality possibly have uh, if there is no transcendent spiritual reality? If matter is all there is, then nothing has inherent meaning and everything becomes subjective which gets very messy very fast. Where did you stumble we, across the, this uh, insight? Like, where were you sitting or like, what were you wrestling with that you, that this insight took you? If you were, I guess if I, you were exposed to zero religion, where did this religious impulse crop up? Gift, gift from God. I really don't know. Okay. I mean, like, 
the story that I tell is I was, tr I was studying for my bar mitzvah. Um, uh, I was sitting with the rabbi and my Torah portion was the 10 commandments, um, which, which was uh, providentially assigned. That wasn't something that I picked. It was just what was, what was being studied on the day that I happened to be bar mitzvah. Hmm. And I was 12 years old and I was sitting in the, I was sitting in the um, rabbi's office and he said something lo along the lines of the second half of the 10 commandments are there so that you don't violate the first half. And I was 12 years old and I was like, that's interesting. I remember having that thought. So that was the first time that I ever had what I might call as like a, a spiritual or religious thought. And then it was just something that I was curious, isn't really the word, interested in, hmm. constitutionally oriented towards, okay. fascinated by for, for my life after that. I can't really say there was ever a moment where I decided that I was going to go looking into this stuff. It was just it was just me, I suppose. Okay. And so yeah. you put yourself in all these situations, seeking oh, yeah. spiritual reality uh, across mm -hmm. multiple regions, multiple cultures. Mm -hmm. Over the course of that journey, where did you f start to find truth or falsehood even? Like, how did you start to assemble an orientation to the divine out of this milieu of experiences? Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, a big turning point for me, um, was in 2013, uh, when I discovered, uh, when I discovered the reality of, of child sex trafficking, that that's a real thing like Jeffrey Epstein, that's a real thing. Hmm. Um, and in a relativistic kind of worldview in a, in a worldview that was sort of based on karma, um, where everything that happens to us in our life is a consequence of things we've done wrong in past lives, right? Uh, in, in an infinite regression, I found it very difficult to say, I, I found that I, I couldn't imagine myself in a thought experiment of being able to look into the eyes of a child who was being used and abused this way and say, sorry, kid, that's just your karma from a past life. I couldn't find that I was able, that didn't sit well with me, nor could I say to a man like Jeffrey Epstein, well, that must be his karma to be that. I felt sickened by the thought of that. And so uh, going into, uh, so, so the whole notion of, of karma got um, rocked essentially by that. And so as I went on these journeys hmm. into a sort of all as one kind of theological worldview, which is re reflected in Hinduism and Buddhism, which form the roots of the new age, I would bring this up from time to time, my real serious moral concerns with this. And I could never get anyone to talk to me about it. They would sweep it under the rug, love and light you know, oh, uh, we don't talk about that. It, it make people very uncomfortable. Hmm. Um, and so that was, um, how did they, that was a big sign for me. Aside from this uncomfortable topic or these uncomfortable questions, how does that philosophy or theology re uh, square the problem of evil? Is, is just evil is just the force out there and human, human beings fate is ordained by some sort of chain of karmic being, but what is evil? Sure. Um, so I can say how I, how I got to that, but um, it, what it did was it, it opened me up. And again, I was coming from a, starting from an atheistic worldview, found my way into Eastern mysticism and also Western occultism, which both share mm -hmm. an all is one kind of worldview. Um, and I can talk about Western occultism also. And, but then the notion that if all, if all is one, all these horrible things are also God, excuse me, God, and it just, it didn't sit well with me. So I was like, maybe there's some limitation to this theology, this theological perspective that I had. So then I got introduced to, uh, to Christianity. Um, and the book was Simply Christian by a man named N.T. Wright. That was a gift from some friends that I had, uh, an underground Christian ministry group that I met at the Burning Man Festival. Oh, well, so. and pardon me. <laughs> is, it, is the title Simply Christian or Simply Christian? <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a sim simply uh, simply Christian, no punctuation. Okay, but it is both the word simply and Christian. That's the title. Oh, oh. Or is it oh, or is the book just Christian? Just <laughs> the, si the, the 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 book title is is, is quote simply Christian okay. end quote. Okay. All right. And you're at Burning Man. Sorry to introduce uh, confusion yes. into your Burning Man experience of all things. No, that's that happens on its own. So um <laughs> so it was at it was at Burning the Burning Man Festival in 2015 where I stumbled into an underground ministry group an underground Christian ministry group. Um, and so that was, 
uh, where I met Christians who really embodied many of the best, uh, best teachings of the faith that I hadn't yet experienced. And so I was like, oh, maybe there's more to this. But then I set out on my around the world adventure to explore many of the things that I did. When I returned from that around the world adventure, they gave me a copy of the book, quote, simply Christian, end quote, by N.T. Wright is the <laughs> author's name. And so I was already carrying these moral qualms about this all is one karmic kind of view. And so when I read the book, Simply Christian, he uh, portrayed a picture of, uh, of conscious, independent evil uh, being triumphed over by the death, sa sacrifice and resurrection of Christ. That evil is an independent thing. It's not karma. It's something that's tr that's truly out there, and that has its own, um, I guess I would say, semi-independent existence that Christ was explicitly sent to overcome, mm -hmm. and he succeeded in doing that. And so that was when I started thinking about Christianity as a religion in a way that I really hadn't before. And then I read *Mere Christianity* by C.S. Lewis and *The Screw Tape Letters*, also by C.S. Lewis. And I saw a picture. Uh, I saw a picture that finally could answer my questions about the existence of evil. I'm sorry, we don't have to get much more into this. We can go back to talking historically or, or about your story. But why is the um, caricature of evil as an entity salient to you? Well, could there be other explanations that are still uh, monotheist in origin, where it, it, evil is a... Um, wh why do we have to anthropomorphize that? Maybe it's just a byproduct of uh, ignorance or uh, malice or uh, some fault in man, some, some brokenness in man. Maybe it's just a part of the system of man that, that is owing to man's failure. Um, why does it have to be an independent? So why, so I guess your question is like, um, is there a metaphysical evil? Like, why does there have to be a metaphysical evil? Can't it just be evil inside, inside, inside man, right? It, yeah. Getting or that? a byproduct mm -hmm. of man, uh, the failures of man. Sure. You, but you also see, you see evil outside of, uh, humanity as well. You have, we have what might, might, what might be called natural evil, natural catastrophes. Of course, many of those are avoidable, but we see things that, uh, on our fallen world that create suffering and, and death. Um, and we have a, and we have a sense, hmm. um, when you, when you begin to see that the evil within man, we're not able to overcome it on our own, no amount of societal control, no government system, no political system, you know, no amount of habit tracking can overcome the innate evil that shows up in our thoughts, words, and actions. Right. And so we begin to get a sense that like, well, mm. if we want to say that there's something innately good about us as humans, which I think many of us do feel that there is some goodness that resides in us somewhere. Why is it that we have this inclination towards evil? If we feel drawn towards something, towards the good, the beautiful and the true, why do our behaviors often drive us to something that is very not that even despite ourselves, right? Could these possibly reflect to um, two related metaphysical conditions. Hmm. And I think that's, that would probably be the best okay. answer I could give for that. So moment. like a condition or a state of being rather than uh, the state of being described anthropomor um, anthropomorphologically as, as a Satan or demons are demons a metaphor to what degree is the metaphor, the anthropomorphized narrative metaphor important as a, as an end in itself or as just a teaching tool to, to conceptualize this really dynamic force. Well, so, so um, the question then is like, where do we learn about God? If we learn about God from, from his word, from the Bible, right? And the Bible is, is, is his word, his inspired word. That's what the Bible says about itself. In the Bible, we see metaphysical evil in the form of demons, in the form of a, a, a leader of demons, Satan, going all the way back to the garden, the first subversion of the family. And we can talk about that. That predates mm. the French Revolution, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. So you, you see metaph metaphysical evil having, having a real existence all throughout God's word, which is where we learn about God. So if this is God's book, if it's his word, it's ho holy, inspired, unbreakable word, right? It's the truth. We see this reflect. We see this documented in the truth, not in metaphorical terms, but in like these are literal supernatural realities. Hmm. And I've also gone to do these supernatural practices, like ayahuasca, like Buddhist meditation, like various kinds of New Age and Western occultism. And I can tell you that if my experience is any, is any indication, and and millions of others, 
um, there is a metaphysical dimension of reality. Um, and mm -hmm. so, and so it's, it's not just a, it's not just a metaphor. There is something truly there on the other side. Hmm. Well, I guess I'm, um, thank you for letting me push back against you. I, I do so Always. not, um, uh, to win some sort of debate, but to really understand and to, you know, to Israel or to struggle with, uh, with these concepts for the sake yeah. of struggling for, with these concepts. Okay. And I guess my impulse to question, you know, why, why do we need to think of God as male? Um, or why do we need to think of evil as a incarnate independent entity is motivated by um, my own moral compass of trying to limit the tools of knowing in order so that those tools of tools of knowing don't become uh, like a hubristic temptation in and of themselves to, you know, to, to see the Bible. God gives this book called the Bible to man Maybe, you know, when, when, uh, when a father gives a book to a child, he doesn't give like a quantum physics book. He gives like, you know, uh, like a dog and a cat go on a physics journey, right? Like he mm -hmm. uses, he uses the tools that will reach us where we are. So to mistake mm -hmm. the tool for the truth or, or the, the manuscript, the map for the territory, it's just a way that I section off my thinking capacity, my believing capacity from my, from actual experience. Cause I don't know, I have no way of knowing beyond the tools of my heart, my mind, and my imagination. Those are how I connect to reality, but reality is far faster than me. So that's just why I, I struggle with, or I question, are we using the term male because God is male or because we, there's something about male that helps us understand God. Like mm. that's, 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 that's the question, I guess, like, Mm -hmm. that I want to bring to you. Like, is God male are we, or, or do we use male because that that's something that we understand to understand God. So the, so the question, the, the question then is um, who the, is, who wrote the Bible, right? Did, did man write the Bible to describe God, right? Was it a product of our thought and imagination, right? Or we'll say spiritual perceptions, right? Are we, are we looking up? As, as humans, you know, or the authors of the Bible, they're looking up trying to describe something that they see, yeah. right? Versus, does God communicate to humans to write what is true about him? Yeah. Right? And it, and so it's not our perception. It's us being guy. It, it's, it's not the author's perceptions. It's God's perceptions being written through them. Yeah. Telling but them about himself. The... the, the, the the key point would be that through though, if you, we can think of a civilization that is light years away from us, that has completely different ways of communicating completely different, um, just parameters, but they're still intelligent. They still have soul. One would assume that God would reach out to them as them. If in so far as Christianity is about a personal God interacting with human, human beings, it's God becoming man. It's God putting himself into the container of man to, to connect two men as close as possible, not necessarily saying that God is encapsulated by the form and the qualities of man. God is, I just, I'm just broken by the thought that God could be contained or fully known as human or as male, because God is, God is God. Like in so far as I understand anything about mm. God is God is far greater than that. And if he wants to make a personal connection with me, he would speak to me in terms that I could understand. If he wanted to bring a message to my city or my time, he would direct me to speak in English, let's say, or in, in mm -hmm. a certain accent, but not, mm -hmm. but his, his language, his way of being is far greater than, than the constraints of, of humans. Yes. So, so the worldview that you're describing is, it, is, it shows up. Um, I'm not saying that this is, this is you, but the worldview that you're describing shows up in sort of the new age as this term, like equating God with the universe, right? Like that God is, that God is hmm. somehow larger, you know, than just the, than just the mere human experience. There must be more to it than that. Mm -hmm. um, now we don't actually know that. And for all we know out there in the universe, male and female might be distinctions that exist throughout the cosmos. First of all, we don't, we don't know that there's any other intelligent life 
in the universe besides besides angels and demons we really don't know in fact i believe we're we're actively prevented from knowing that hmm. so for all we know male and female may be rooted fundamentally into the nature of reality that we could go traveling to other 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 planets and the other planets could be like yeah we got men and women here too it seems to be everywhere we go mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but I, I think what's true about earth and if you read the cs lewis space trilogy um this shows up, which is a, a brilliant trilogy. So Tolkien, the story goes that uh, that C.S. Lewis and, and Tolkien, I don't know if it's true or not, yeah. that they flipped a coin to determine who would write the fantasy and who would write the science fiction series. Hmm. And so C.S. Lewis got the got the science fiction series and Tolkien got the fantasy series. Hmm. That's probably not true, but yeah. that's how it kind of shook out. So the C.S. Lewis space trilogy talks about this, where one of the things that defines Earth um, as potentially different from the entire cosmos is that we were the species that was dumb enough to disobey God, hmm. that God gave Adam and Eve this paradise earth, a true paradise, abundant, peaceful, lying, lion lying down with the lamb, right? Where it's just like, cultivate this garden earth forever. Enjoy it. Be fruitful and multiply. Enjoy this bounty I've created for you. Just don't do this one thing. Just don't go eat from that tree. And humanity, <laughs> being what we are, it's like, I think I'm going to go do that thing, yeah. <laughs> right? Tempted by metaphysical evil, which was the serpent, which was Satan. So we decided in that moment to listen to the voice of metaphysical evil and not listen to the voice of God or good. And so we lost this paradise earth mm -hmm. and the world f fell and became broken. And so did, and so did we it became corrupted by sin. And so uh, what you see in the CS Lewis space trilogy is he, uh, talks about how we are the one planet that did that. And if there are other planets out there necessitating God to come down as man to rectify it, like to fix this cosmic level disaster, hmm. co cosmic catastrophe, not the fall, but the crash, as Pastor Doug Wilson says, hmm. it required God becoming man and suffering and dying, being betrayed and tortured and all these different terrible things. God had to become man to suffer and die to fix the mess that we made. And other planets in the cosmos, if they exist, would probably regard that as, why would you ever do that? <laughs> and then also marvel at God's glory that he would come and rescue such a backward planet such as us, full of sinners like you and me and everyone, mm -hmm. right? That God cares so much about this one planet. Because you imagine a, a cosmos full of sentient life, right? But there's this one planet in the middle of nowhere, backwoods, in the Milky Way galaxy, mm -hmm. who was foolish enough to disobey, and God had to come fix it himself. What a glorious picture of God. Yeah. But God is not necessarily confined in the act of becoming man to teach man or to fix man's problems, right? God could, if God created everything, God is at one with everything. Anyways, the question is, I don't want to get like yeah. dug in there. Oh, I just like my brain, awesome. my brain. Yeah. The question is, what does God, be, what is thinking of God as male tell us about God? And what does that tell us about how to be male? Mm -hmm. So um, what does thinking about God as well, when God reveals himself as male, what does that, what does that tell us about God? Yeah. And so I would say that the way to, the best way to answer that question outside of, uh, outside of God's word, because we can find him there, is to look at the best aspects of what it means to be a man and recognize the best, highest, most noble, and look, and look at those and see them as characteristics of God. I'll give you, I'll give you a good example outside, outside the Bible. So you think of the movie Braveheart, which I assume that everyone has, has seen, um, and uh, I'm going to spoiler alert for everyone who hasn't seen it. So cover your ears. But one of the most powerful aspects of that movie is that the character of William Wallace, and we see this in other, in other movies as well. The character of William Wallace played by Mel Gibson is a, a noble, just righteous leader. He's, he's wise and he's intelligent and he's thoughtful and he's powerful. Right. And he, and he's noble and he's inspiring. He's all these best qualities but at the very end of the, at the end of the movie, what happens? He's, he gives it all up, is tortured and dies for the thing that he believes in shouting freedom rather than being released from pain. He goes out with the word freedom on his lips and inspires a revolution. 
So that not only is he powerful, he's also powerfully self-sacrificial. And so we look at these qualities and say, everyone sees these movies, or you watch The Lord of the Rings, or you watch Gladiator, pick your favorite, or you know, even Star Wars with Darth Vader at the very end. You see these very powerful, sometimes they go awry, but you see these very powerful men, their highest use of power is in, the highest use is in self-sacrifice. Ultimately, these very powerful men climb to the very heights of power and they give their lives to create new life. This is so deeply resonant in our hearts as men. And so that is the picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the most powerful man in a sense to ever live, certainly a man of great moral courage, a man of great physical strength, the son of a son of a carpenter. He says uh, in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, he said, I could command 12 legions of angels to come down and stop this if I wanted to. So clearly he's a man of spiritual power as well. What does he do? He dies and gives his life to pay the sin debt for, for his people. What do we see in husbands and fathers? self-sacrificial love, working long hours, rushing into burning buildings to save women and children first. So what does this say about God? What does it say about men? What does it say about men made in the image of God? Hmm. So this goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning about the French Revolution, the Communist Revolution, and mm. this uh, sacrificing of your higher functions for just the lower um, immediate pleasures. And why, why self-sacrifice is an anathema to... I'm trying to, I'm, I'm just, you're making me think of so many things. <laughs> it's hard to articulate that, but mm -hmm. how, how does, if we are to fix the world, um, or at least the West, let's say, mm -hmm. and you're describing the problem as owing to the French revolution, owing to the decapitation of the King, uh, the, death of God, quote unquote, um, the surrendering of one's immediate sexual um, control uh, and, and the loosening of morals around that as a way of, you know, envisioning a better world. I think that's what they, that's what they want, right? The communists, they want a better world, don't they? Uh, In the French revolutionaries, they wanted a better world, right? That's what they said. I don't. I don't think that that's borne out by their actions. Yeah, but they, they, they want a better world for them. Oh, okay, they for want them. a better world for them. Okay, yeah, <laughs> which might not be the same thing as a better world. How does how does self sacrifice as a moral compass show us the way to reconstructing a better society? How how does that mm. translate into a better world? Sure. So um, the way that it can show up in our in our lives. Um, our lives every day is, um, I guess the term is crucify, mortifying the flesh, crucifying the flesh, like recognize what are my, what are my sinful or disordered desires that I am desiring to do other than the thing I should be doing. Right. And that shows up in all of our lives as men and women in countless different ways, particularly in our modern era, which offers pleasure and convenience, you know, sense pleasures and convenience in abundance and absolutely not the discipline of hard work. It requires quite a lot of discipline to show up to accomplish anything of value. This shows up for most people in physical fitness, building a business, building a fence, like you name it. Like the, the ease and ability that we can check out into sense pleasures mm. versus putting forth the effort to build or create something of value, right? It's completely, it's completely disordered. So in our everyday lives, we can see dying to self, self-sacrifice, sacrificing pleasure, sacrificing dopamine for serotonin, as they say, as Dr. Jordan Peterson would say, that is one way that we can die to self. The other way that I think it's very necessary for, for people to die to self is leaders. I think we have, um, we have a, a kleptocracy uh, where we have our, our institutions, our governments, our corporations where the leadership um, and our non-governmental organizations and our extra governmental organizations, where the leadership has become entirely parasitic on the people. And people have used the, the, the levers, the meta technologies of institutions, government, law, finance, sports, transportation. They've used these meta technologies as tools for personal enrichment. So they've climbed to the very top of the pyramid and they're trying to see them, board of directors, whatever their councils, whatever, are trying to see how much wealth they can extract out of the people rather than conceiving themselves as 
servants of the people. And so we have individually in our own lives, the self-sacrifice that all of us as, as perhaps citizens, let's say, can do to move towards a more righteous way of living and towards our goals. There's also a call for leaders to sacrifice themselves and their desires mm -hmm. for the good of the whole. Yeah. But we don't, we see the opposite of that in all of our lives, leaders and not, we yeah. see pursuing you know, our, our baser desires, our baser pleasures. And we see as a result, our leaders pursuing their baser desires of self-aggrandizement. And so this is, this is, this is how self-sacrifice in the image of God can help fix the West. Yeah. What do you think about uh, modern day male discourse from the red pill to the manosphere to the weird <laughs> online dissident, right? Who you know, wants to champion a Caesar, but is constantly uh, criticizing women for dancing on spring break or, or uh, getting into <laughs> little squibbles about like a girl wrestling with a catfish, which is obviously a catfish. <laughs> I've, particip I've participated in some Yeah, in some you can't, you can't help yourself, you, you know? Yeah. Well, okay. So, so we'll take one of those, um, one of those at a time. So the Manosphere, I was formally kicked out of the Manosphere in 2022. They gave you a letter or did they come up with yeah. bats and beat your butt? No. Like they a real man. Uh, <laughs> right. No, I was, I was given a very sternly worded letter. <laughs> what bitches? Pardon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. The, the, the so-called president of the Manosphere <laughs> banished me. Literally, you are hereby banished. I should go find the letter. Yeah. I was like, got okay, exiled so. from the, from yes, Cooperland. Jeez. I'm so sorry, <laughs> man. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all right, man. It's all right. So, um, and, and so uh, now there are a lot of men in that world that, that up until that point, I had learned a lot from um, about what it means to be a man, because I think okay. that the, the value of the manosphere was that it was very good at talking about, and I said this on Twitter, it was very good at talking about what men do. Men, uh, men build wealth, they build, uh, they build strength, they build status. Like these, are, these are things that we do. Okay. But if we don't know why we do them, they become self-serving. So if all we're doing is like, well, I'm just going to get really physically fit and really strong, and then I'm going to go look in the mirror, that becomes vanity. Or if I'm just going to make a lot of money and I just want to add a zero this year, that becomes greed. Oh, I want, I want status. Oh, I want to be you know, really popular. That becomes fame. And these become pursuits that become self-serving. But the, re the reason why men do these things, why we build wealth, why we build strength, why we build status is to die to self and serve a family with them, yeah. which is what the Manosphere was never about. The Manosphere was very educational for men, showing men who had never received these lessons before, like myself, yeah. what do men do? But it couldn't actually tell me what men are for. No tell and us. So, uh, exactly. Bingo. So, um, so hmm. I started realizing that I started kind of challenging some of the leadership and they didn't like that. So I got formally, I got formally kicked out. Hmm. Now the red pill the red pill is an interesting one because um, the the red pill also had interesting things to say about um, the sexual marketplace was their their primary insight, which was that um, women's sexual market value and men's sexual market value peak at different times in our lives. Excuse me. So yeah. the observations that it made, contrary to feminism, were true. But then what it said to do about that was completely false. Right. Hmm. So it's like you can look and say, hey, we just observed this thing. And now what you should do about it is trash. <laughs> like you can you can observe a truth and draw a terrible conclusion, a terrible, immoral behavioral conclusion from it. And that's what we're seeing now what, with the red pill. They, what's the yeah. general telos of the red pill? After you get all these facts, what do you do about it? Well, it, it depends. Like what, what it says to um, what it says to men is that society is irreparably broken. So just spin plates or have lots of girls that you're seeing and avoid settling down and getting married and okay. you know just have fun and and give give us money, right? That's yeah. the, that's okay. the telos of the red pill, and it's it's cool for like for 10 years until the creators in it become in like their forties and their fifties and start being really gross or gross or until the second and third generation guys, they turn it more and more into like a racket, right? The first guys were like, Hey, things are really broken. Yeah. We should look into this. And then you go a couple generations down the line and it becomes like, uh, hmm. you know, they like don't go chuckle, chuckle heads. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. So, um, and so the manosphere ran into that as well. So, um, what else did you ask? I just wanted to bring up, there's this movie called Barbie. 
And <laughs> in the movie called Barbie, there's this guy named Ryan Gosling. He's Ken. And he gets huh. this shirt. I have, I have my own version. It says, Ben, I'm Ben Uff. But he was, his, his whole thing was what you're describing about these little online male movements where they, sure. they, they act like men. They have like these manly revolutions, but in the end, they're still gelded men. They are still, well, I don't know if you saw the movie. Did you? Mm-mm. No, you're missing out, man. Yeah. At the end, it's, I, I feel it was like I saw it. Everyone talking about it, it was such a cell phone because Barbie didn't want Ken. She didn't want a man in her life, but she did want a vagina. So she goes after the pursuit of a vagina, but the vagina is worthless because she doesn't want a man. And Ken, oh, interesting. Ken just wanted horses. He just wanted to play. He he was totally fine in his make believe world of like we're going to stage this little masculine coup. He wanted all the signals of masculine, and this might be a byproduct or what I'm seeing right here in um, uh, in relief to or in response to what you're talking about, about these two modern movements that happened, took place and, and carried out themselves online, is that online, is, it's a make-believe land. You can't actually actualize masculinity. You can't actually bring to fruition or fulfill the destiny of man in that mm-hmm. virtual world, unless you're, because you can't build anything. At least... I mean, you could be a game designer, but, you know, you end up gaming rather than game designing. You end up playing rather than actually, you know, going to actual war or like building a family. Mm -hmm. Right. So Mm -hmm. there's something there's something capped in that world that people don't want to back out of or it stunts. If people stay in that world, it seems like they end up like a Ken where I'm enough. It's enough that I'm just a man, which is just the same Mm -hmm. thing as the feminist. It's enough that I'm just a woman. Like there's no Mm -hmm. higher purpose to my sex than Mm -hmm. my sex and Mm -hmm. sex. Yes. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's conceiving of women's sexuality as identical with men's. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and and, and essentially men's uh, social uh, reality is identical to females. We're, we're glad to just bitch online and do reputation destruction, you know, and write strongly worded letters to one another. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well said. I see what you did there. So, um, and, 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 uh, I didn't actually see the movie, but um, I hadn't heard that. It's Sorry funny, to bring of all it up, the people man. talk. No, that's okay. Of all the people talking about, it, I'd never heard that anyone said that Barbie went went on a quest for a vagina, yeah. which is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. she and she leaves at- her fake land and then goes to a gynecologist to get one installed. Installed. Yeah, and one of the one of the extras <laughs> with the most line was was actually a tranny too. It was really interesting. It was such, and it was a cell phone because the woman a cell phone because the woman not a cell phone a cell phone because the woman <laughs> who wrote it and directed it she responded negatively to the uh, to the reactionary uptaking of the she didn't understand what she was writing. Oh, it's such a. The- if she, she's just completely ignorant of like, like the parameters of the story that she's writing are way beyond her capacity to understand. I, I had heard that, but since I had, it's a little bit like a, like Starship Troopers, like yeah. Paul Verhoeven wanted yeah. to write Starship Troopers as like a satire, but like yeah. all the right wing bros are like, no, this is the, no, this, <laughs> this is, is like it. the anthem. Dude, this yeah, is this the is bugs. Exactly. You, you, you get it perfectly, right? <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny you said that. Um, you said that there's there's a way in which uh, online, you know, can be kind of. I'll, I'll paraphrase and say empty. It's a little bit like getting a master's degree in jazz and not being able to play, hmm. right? Like, congratulations, you you know all about jazz, but like here's a horn. Oh, you can't. <laughs> so what do you what, what have you learned? Versus, can you actually like get up and play? So you can talk big about mm-hmm. being a man, yeah. right? And 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 many guys do. And I think there is a place for righteous online dialogue. I think it's necessary. But in, there's in, there's in, money in, to be made, man. So yeah, exactly. Oh, for sure. And, and 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 I don't even think it's necessarily a bad thing that that people make money online, right? But where where you start actively provoking specifically for the purposes of making money that's where things get kind of morally gray mm. like that's grifting yeah. grifting is like i could make a productive contribution to this dialogue but it won't it won't go as far so instead i'm going to be actively provocative and perhaps even like kind of dumb right so that i can make it go further and then monetize it mm. right so that's that that's that's yeah. the definition of grifting that i heard and i and i think that that's that's you know very morally gray at best versus attempting to which is what i try to do talk about virtue yeah right which is like here's how we can genuinely be better people and of course like that doesn't that doesn't always sell right and so uh so the grift you know is a very real aspect of it which i think is is very problematic because i think men and women need something more than um hey i'm just going to provoke you so i can profit off of it 
Um, and that's when it been a big problem with the dialogue is that mm-hmm. that's kind of what it's gotten to. And you have a lot of men, a lot of men who are provoking and they're not actually living it offline, which is being revealed. Mm-hmm. You brought up uh, this interesting topic. It's called woman. Mm-hmm. Um I've heard of them. Yeah. So in, in this, uh, and again, apologize for you, apologize to the audience. We went all over the place. We haven't made a, like a coherent, like structural argument of your worldview, but in your worldview, uh, what is a man? And then what is the place of the woman? How does it, does woman not manifest qualities of God? Is there not the same, um, divine, um, aspects that are revealed to us through the nature the beatitude, the desires, and and the ethics or the good, the goodness inherent in the woman. Mm. Of course, women women are naturally. I mean, the goodness inherent in woman, like, is there goodness in, inherent in man? Like, like I guess okay. I guess there's so so I guess we need to separate like made in the image of God from inherent goodness, yeah. right? Because, because well, that's why I was um, arguing about like God being male because we're it's it's the distinction between made in the image of god or made sure. as the image of god right right yeah so so um so god is intrinsically holy good and and perfect um and god is male that does not mean that male is into in, intrinsically good and holy and, and mm. perfect okay we are, we are all of us here on earth are sinners in in, in need of a savior mm-hmm. right so i don't i don't mean to say that men are inherently because it's objectively false any more righteous than women are, or I also don't believe that women are inherently more righteous than, than men are. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a really important, that's a really important thing as well. So, um, so both men and women are made in God's image. Both men and women have inherent value as a result of being made in God's image. Those are two really important things to get because nothing that I say after this will make any sense, right? Okay. Once you see that both men and women are made in the image of God and have intrinsic value, then we begin talking about hierarchy. Hierarchy is woven into the fabric of reality. And that hierarchy extends also into the family, right? And within the context of family, there is a hierarchy. And the hierarchy is the man leads, the woman follows. But her following does not make her morally inferior. It does not make her in terms of value inferior. This is just how the hierarchy works and the children follow as well, right? So this is the duality between um, made in the image of God, both having in- inherent worth and also hierarchy. The, 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 I guess we might say the paradox of hierarchy and equality. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think about uh, the notion of interlocking domains? Like a woman has like a purview or like a, a domain of authority where man is uh, the second class or the, the follower, let's say the, the obedient one. And, and man has like another encapsulating, you know, like woman's in control of the home, man's in control of the fence and everything outside of it kind of thing. What do you think about that? Um, I don't think that that would be biblically accurate because um, that would be uh, because you can, you can see a parallel of the relationship between a husband and wife between the husband and Christ. So uh, the husband follows, follows Christ, right? And so there would not be a situation where a husband would say, well, Christ, you know, Jesus, you've got this, and I've got this area, which is outside of your authority. All authority flows downwards. And so in the same way, like you would be saying that, okay, I work for, if you're, if you're thinking about it in like a corporate context, Mm -hmm. like there's no authority, like if you're the director, a manager is under the director, there's nothing a manager is doing that's outside of the authority of the director. And there's nothing that the director is doing that's outside the authority of the vice president. Right. So you can think of it in terms of umbrellas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just think like umbrellas of authority. Yeah, but the authority. Yeah, this. I, I sorry, I don't want to get stuck in these little quibbles, and That's okay. I find my mind uh, trying to scratch at that because just because the, uh, the the vice president has authority over everything that the uh, manager has, the manager is in control of that, and the vice president yeah. doesn't want to be bothered with the other things. And the vice president going in and telling the manager what to do negates the need for a manager. So there are... Right. Yeah, 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 micromanaging. It, yeah, it's like, so So there's realms of authority where the vice president says, that's that, that I'm going to give you control over this. And as long as things aren't um, 
uh, manifesting a problem, then I don't have to worry about that. So I'm not going to control yeah. it for you. So that's another yeah, yeah, way yeah. of like reconstru uh, reconstruing or reconstituting the interlocking domains of authority. Yeah, absolutely. Well, interlocking sort of, yes. I mean, you like a, 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 a director is underneath a vice president and the direct and the vice president delegates authority to the director, yeah. right? This is my authority. And, and the vice president's authority is delegated from the CEO, like all the way up the chain. Okay. The CEO's authority is delegated from the board of directors. The board of directors, in a sense, is delegated by the shareholders. So all authority is flowing down and kind of a little bit like a waterfall. So the vice president delegates authority to the director and the director is able to operate autonomously, you know, and make decisions, et cetera. Now, ultimately, the vice president is the one who is accountable yeah. for the actions of the director, right? So if, if, if the director goes and squanders a bunch of money or, 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 um, or boots a project or something like that, like it ultimately lands on the vice president's desk in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on the gravity can even add, land on the CEO's desk in this model. So, so it's not that like there's a there's a degree of like authority and autonomy are not necessarily in conflict. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to the, tease uh, out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So, so the husband can have authority over over the over the household, and the household is a broader concept than just the than just the house, right? The the home, the 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 productive nature, the orientation of the family towards a towards a um, a collective goal. So the husband can have authority. Others can still have autonomy, but the autonomy does not happen in a realm outside of the husband's authority. Okay. And that authority is delegated right from God to Christ, to the husband. So the husband himself is also under authority. He can't just operate with impunity. Well, the, the question is going to be, how do you convince American women of this? But one, uh, one imaginary um, problem with what you're saying about the husband leading the wife and the wife, uh, it's just a matter of competence. An, in, an incompetent wife would want to find a husband that could provide everything for her. She won't have to make any decisions because it's all his authority. It's all his doing. And uh, a competent woman looking at the landscape says, well, I need, if I'm going to serve somebody, he better be top notch. And where are these guys, where are these guys to be found? Right. Mm. So without question of competence, it's kind of, you know, you said like, with Christ, you know, like God, Christ has got authority. And he, I just made, um, my mind leapt to that story of Mary and Martha, where Mary's at the feet of Jesus, mm -hmm. like hanging out, laughing with the, with the God man. Martha's in there doing all the dishes, right? Jesus isn't like telling her what to do with the spatula and where to put the knife and like, oh no, that, that pan is going to get rusted if you use soap. So don't do that. So Mar Martha's got her own domain over there. And, mm -hmm. and Mary's got kind of like, there's a story there about like, whatever that story is about, but there is an image of Christ not controlling everybody, allowing everybody to be competent in their own domains. Right. Sure. Yeah. The, the purpose of the purpose of that story, I mean, there, there, we were talking again about autonomy, but the purpose of that story is like Martha actually, you know, goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, tell Mary to come help me. And Jesus is like, Mary's doing what she needs to be doing right now. She's at Jesus's feet. So it's, so the story is actually about Martha being a, a bit of a busybody, right. And not okay. properly using her time and saying like, Mary is here in, in an act of worship. Like you don't, don't worry about her so much. It's sort of chastising to Martha as well. Like maybe you should be a little bit less worried about, mm -hmm. you know, all of the functions of hosting and should be here with the God man while, while he's still here. Right. So that's, that's the purpose of that story. Um, of that, of that illustration to show, um, to show perhaps faithfulness versus busybodiness. And, and so with regard to, um, with regard to competence, um, you know, uh, we started talking about the sexual revolution and we started talking about, um, Wilhelm Reich and we started talking about sexual liberation and we started talking about masculinity. And one of the things, uh, and, and the purpose of the masculinity dialogue and skilling up men to become more competent. Right. And so, there are actually a lot of those men. There are a lot of very competent, competent men out there. Um, and unfortunately, what a lot of those competent men find is um, they get uh, discarded and thrown out because they're not as exciting as the bad boys. And so uh, this is the function of sexual liberation, which is that my sexuality, right? isn't meant to serve a husband and a family. It's meant to serve my own thrills 
and that was what that was one of the reasons why this was why this was done and so um hmm. so for for um of course the economic like the economic impact of feminism you know the um the prioritization of uh of uh, the female over the male in society in fact i have a book here i can read you a portion uh, it's called disciplines of a godly man by kent hughes and he talks about in the beginning of this book how um there's been a preference for um female daughters even ex- uh there's only one kind of daughter, even uh, even into adoption. So I <laughs> have a study. Thanks for clarifying today. Yeah, in these exactly. times, you don't know <laughs> so. exactly. So this is a this is a 2016 um, New York Times article by Andrew Reiner called "The Fear of Having a Son," and um, I'll just read a quote. He uh, Kent Hughes in Disciplines of a Godly Man cites this. He says. Quote, in a 2010 study, economists from the California Institute of Technology, the London School of Economics, and New York University discovered, among other things, that adoptive American parents preferred girls to boys by nearly a third. Adoptive parents are even willing to pay an average of $16,000 more in finalization costs for a girl than a boy. Many fertility doctors observe that 80% of patients who are choosing their baby's gender prefer girls. And so you see that there's been a wholesale preference. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Well, th- th- that could be owing to different things. I could list off a couple of different yeah, please. reasons that uh, it's easier to... Well, adoption-wise, it's you're probably... Uh, your sense of belonging with a female is probably going to be... It's probably going to be easier to adapt to a female. It's probably easier to control a female, to socially regulate a female. If you get an adoptive boy a boy's just kind of going to be the sperm carrier and that wild energy from another man. So forwarding, it's kind of like dovetails with like women being perceived of as property much easier than men are perceived of as property. I don't, I don't, I don't see anything in our society, particularly not in 2016 that regards women as property in, in, in that. um, Well, if you look at uh, equity, you know, scores, like, you know, they have to have so many women. So in, in a way I'm, I'm, being facetious but sure right but but with adoption that's specifically like you are buying a child right but even fertility doctors say they have an 80 percent preference i think is what the number was so even if it's your own child it's like i think we 80 percent preference for girls over boys and that reflects a larger societal attitude right of uh maybe girls maybe girls a little better than boys you referred to a boy as a sperm carrier from another man like that's a i, I don't know I, no i was I being I, I was being i was being very I, i'm not that's not my belief no, i'm just okay, thinking your, like if you do the I'm, evolutionary whoa. math i'm sure there are like uh, subconscious like you know this is like it's baked into human beings that we went around slaughtered all the men and took all the women right it's just that's just yeah. how our psychology goes that's how social goes and then also like it might be easier in this environment and it is easier in this environment highly regulated highly uh, passive uh, a lot of like mental uh, work to do not a lot of physical labor not a lot of wars it it just it makes sense that women it, women adapt to this environment easier than men women men are, are more like, agreeable you know yeah, they're more, more agreeable. agreeable. In That's this right. in this environment, it makes sense that like women, female traits, or women themselves are have a leg up in this environment. Yes, and so and so we started out the conversation talking about what is the value of masculinity. Yeah, and the big the big problem is what we've constructed a, a society in the West based on a, a service economy, a consumer economy, an office economy where agreeableness, where high IQ and agreeableness and obedience are prized. What is not prized, right, is physical strength and disagreeableness and having your own attitudes about things, right? And so there's a way in which masculinity, in, in particularly in the West over the past 50 to 60 years, has been progressively stamped out of men to make them more agreeable, to make them a little bit in, in their nature, a little bit more like women. Mm. And women, by contrast, have been taught to be disagreeable. And so we see that in our films. We see it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We see that. that that's why is that purpose. the case? Why, why do women need to become uh, men or manifest male traits? And uh, men well, that's manifest sexual liberation. Female. Okay. That's sexu- the sexual liberation is that um, that's, that's the purpose of that. Because women's sexuality should be something for pure enjoyment and pleasure, just like men's sexuality is. 
right? So that's that was the purpose of that. The women should be able to enjoy their sexuality purely for their own fulfillment, not for procreation. And that was very still very difficult to do until mm-hmm. abortion and until yeah. uh, until birth control. And so now with abortion and birth control and no fault divorce as well, there's essentially no consequence, right? There's no consequence for uh, women's women's sexual licentiousness identical to men's sexual licentiousness, right? And so so you have women who are being to who are becoming more like men as a result of sexual liberation, right? And so you have more men who are becoming uh, more agreeable and becoming more like more like women, or they're manifesting. A better way to phrase it is that um, women are becoming masculinized and men are becoming effeminate, right? That would be the language. That's a that's a better language. But then you see the the crossing over of transgen- transgenderism that says, well, there really isn't a whole lot of difference anyway. So men can become women, women can become men, and we don't actually know if there's any difference. So let's just have a man jump in the pool and you know, like he says he's a woman. So who are we to say, right? And mm-hmm. so you start to see this, this progressive blurring throughout society. And that does go back to the sexual revolution. That does go back to Reich. Yeah. It does the, go back the, to the French revolution. The problem with convincing the modern American female specifically, but males and females is that, um, of, of the burden, convincing them of the burden, convincing them convincing of them. obedience. Like yeah, your job is to follow I mean, yeah. we, 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 if we want to have these lines back, we and can't just stop at bio- biology, and biology just doesn't stop at the neck. You guys have different uh, proclivities. These guys have yeah. different proclivities and stuff, but also moral destinies to fulfill. Yeah, exactly. And the women's, I, I don't, I'm not jealous of women, like what no. women have to go through and what women have to bear. Sure. And if society's offering them freedom, liberation, uh, individualism all the wine and cats that you your heart desires like how are you going to persuade if that's even the point um women and men to buy into this uh chastity modesty self-control yeah there's there's a couple different answers for that um one answer of course is that you don't and that birth rates and uh no it solves itself yeah, it solves itself, and so and civilization, Western civilization collapses and needs to import millions of people from elsewhere to make our to make our civilization run. Right, that's that's what mm. has been actively pursued in, in mm. many ways. Um, uh, uh, going back, again wait, the to pill the, led to the border crisis. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is this is like if if we're, if we're not going to birth people here to 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 run our civilization, where are we going to get them? If not automation, right? If, Mm -hmm. if, if, if people aren't having kids, the pill and abortion, 60 million babies have been aborted. 60 million. That's a lot of people. It's just in America, just in America. Yeah. How many Mozarts, how many legendary scientists, how many inventors have been, you know, snuffed out. And so where are we going to get those people? Right to to make our civilization to make mm. our civilization go if we're not having them here, mm-hmm. and so so yeah and the all these things are connected all these things are very much connected. Mm. So one answer is that <clears throat> how do we convince them? One answer is that we don't, and uh, <clears throat> you know things drive off a cliff. The other answer is um, enough women who are um, forty plus and single and uh, did you you froze again? Yeah, you froze. No, you froze. No, no, you froze. Uh, one of the reasons, well, one, one method is you don't. Yeah. But what if you want to, what's the other one? Uh, okay. So, uh, one method is you can look, (laughs) you can look at the epidemic of, um, you can look at the epidemic of, of single and childless women older than 40 or 45, um, which is documented in the mainstream media and see the pain that it's causing women. And they can look and they can say, Maybe I don't want that. And they can make a choice, right? Um, the yeah. other is you can uh, you can pray for civilizational repentance, right? You can preach the whole counsel of God inside the churches and out. And you can say that mm. this is um, this is God's design and we've tried the other way and it hasn't worked. Okay. So maybe, maybe we can try it this way, which is which worked for a while, but everyone had to give something up. And that's, that's yeah. the part that's very difficult in this age of, of easy pleasure, um, sexual and otherwise. Why would I give up all of this pleasure when I can numb myself out, man or woman, with sex or porn or video games or food 
or Netflix, right? There's a thousand different ways that we can all check out from our responsibilities, you know, from dying to self. And so why would I, why would I do that? If I have nothing to live for, let me just slap on my Apple vision pros and, uh, and go into the, and go into, you know, the metaverse I, and forget my body alt- altogether. Like I, all these things are connected. Yeah. But I think, I think what you're describing with the Apple vision pro, at least, and just what you, them. Well, yeah, what, what you were d- describing is a male typical way of checking out. Like the women who are sure. single 40, 45 are single because they were career. They were, they worked their butts off. They have, hmm. they went for legacy right sure. they went for money they went for doing things in the world they run the world actually no Meh. yeah i mean it's kind of, it's got to be so. longhouse for a reason um, well i mean the long the longhouse is the longhouse is owned by blackrock so oh okay <laughs> but but what what is the positive vision you said god's design what what is the positive sure. vision and how does that actually translate and and i'm assuming you want people to opt into this individually which opens up the question of a christian right. nationalism absolutely yeah i mean so the so gosh there's so many things wrapped into this so um i don't i don't know where to begin with answering that question because you can you can go in through the door of christian nationalism uh, or you can go in through the door of of national repentance, but let's let's start with the let's start with individuals. Yeah. So um, so the um, the teaching, the real teaching of the gospel is none can draw close to the Father unless the Father unless. Sorry, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, sorry, I I lost I, I couldn't hear for a second. Anyway, none can draw close to the Father unless the Father draws them. So uh, the idea is that. Um, Many are the idea called is, fewer chosen or something like that, right? Or many are yeah, some, something something like that. Um, uh, the idea the idea being that um, God calls us people. God calls people to repentance uh, and faith in Him, uh, and that is a sovereign a sovereign move of God. And that's why I'm here because I I shouldn't be here. I was I was living a life with a trajectory that was not at all where I am now. Uh, and uh, it was God's sovereign call that led me here, hallelujah, and, and delivered me from the direction that I was on. And that's the story when you hear about people who describe themselves as born-again Christians, even though I grew up with that as a, as a derogatory term, I understand it now as, um, as a very beautiful thing, um, even though people can, can be unskilled uh, in the way that they talk about it, or they can present themselves in uh, socially uncalibrated ways and perhaps be so be aggressive, there is a reality to being born again. There's a reality to becoming a new creation in Christ. And that is available to all with repentance. And um, my prayer every day is that we as a nation be granted repentance, um, a, a repentance that leads to faith, and that we, uh, both men and women, live in alignment with um, with God's will for the household and, and for the family. And that is, that is my prayer. So that can come about on an individual, a social and collective basis without the need for any external influence, like the form of a, the form of a government or any, you know, uh, cultural kind of impulse. Uh, so the Christian nationalism argument, which I'm also part of, and I strongly, strongly recommend the book because the, 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 the phrase Christian nationalism has different meanings to different people. And uh, it's a, it's a great screen that people can project their, biggest longings and their worst fears onto, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? It's it's very useful for that. And uh, people who do both of those things, the way that I described it in my podcast about it was some people hear the words Christian nationalism and they hate both those words. So they imagine that it's like one plus one equals negative three. So both those words together must be even worse. Mm. And then there are some people who hear both those words and they love both of those words. And so they think those two things together will be even better. Like and I described it on my podcast as like peanut butter and jelly and bananas. You know what I mean? Mm. It's even better. Mm. And so both of those people, like they're natural enemies of each other. And so the way that Twitter works now is you take those people and you put them in a jar and you shake them up real good together and then you release them on Twitter. And that's what we get the dialogue about Christian nationalism. The book, however, The Case for Christian Nationalism by Stephen Wolf. I think is the best picture of, uh, of Christian nationalism that I read. It's a 500 page, heavily cited, heavily footnoted and sourced book that talks about the way that we can uh, use government and cultural power to guide people to righteousness and salvation in the church. The idea is that um, 
is that if we truly desire the good for people, then salvation in Christ is the greatest good that we can possibly desire for people. So we can construct, uh, we can construct a government and a culture that guides people like guardrails to that highest good in the church. Hmm. So it's not theocracy. It's not theonomy. It's the idea of how can we conceive of the way to build a nation that guides people towards salvation? That's the Christian nationalism that I'm, that I'm in favor of. Um, not as, not as, uh, what's the, the famous saying when fascism comes to the United yeah, States, they'll be carrying a cross and wrapped flag in a flag. And yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, dildo I don't believe... at your child. <laughs> Whoa. That escalated <laughs> quickly. God, no, I'm fascism. talking about... <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I mean like fascism, fascism has lots of different faces. It doesn't just have one. It isn't just like Mussolini, right? Yeah. Uh, which is the traditional definition or Stalin or Hitler or whoever. Fascism looks so many, so many different ways Depending where you have a binding nation. Yeah. Well, it has so many different, like there are all different ways that you can bind people together for power. Right. And so, but it's all the same impulse. Fascism is just the impulse to control people for individual will to power. It's all the same yeah. thing. It comes right? from so, the, it comes from the Latin uh, faces, which means, which is a bundle of sticks actually. Um, yes. Which is kind yes. of funny. To me, but I haven't been able to figure out the perfect tweet yet. But I still toy around. With it. <laughs> yes, but anyway, so like, so, so whether you want to go in through the Christian nationalism door or whether you wanted to go in through the individual repentance door, I don't think these doors are fundamentally in opposition. I think there's, I think there's both. Mm -hmm. But when we look at where American society is at right now, um, we've tried it a non-Christian way, an explicitly non-Christian way, like rejecting Christianity from, from the public sphere. Right, the the term that I heard that I love is fundamentalist pantheist, right, mm. or uh, therapeutic moralistic deism, right. We've removed God from the public square, and we're just going to try it our own way mm. based on these values, and it's not working. It's not working in the cities. It's not working outside of the cities. It's not working nationally. It's not working internationally. It's not working between states. It's not working between families. Has it ever right? worked though? Has has whatever worked? Has it ever been a Christian world? I mean, do are yeah. we just imagining that at some point things were chill, and not on the brink <laughs> brink of utter collapse? I think uh, no, I don't think we were always on the brink of utter collapse. I think that there were fundamentally Christian cultural and governmental assumptions that were built into hmm. the nation from the start that we derived the benefits of okay. for a couple hundred years until until beginning explicitly in the nineteen sixties we started take, pulling those out of society hmm. and there are all kinds of books that talk about this. So, um, so yes, it did work. It, it wasn't perfect, right? Absolutely was not, but the goal is not perfection. We won't achieve perfection on this side of heaven, but it was, it was functional. And again, not perfect because certain people will say, well, it didn't work for this group. It didn't work for this group, but we didn't have to demolish the whole thing to make it work for that group. Hmm. We could have made it work for everybody with enough time, but the the violent impulse of, of civilizational destruction, particularly of, of the father, as we've talked about, you know, was was the method that was taken. Rather than we're gonna we're gonna operate within the principles of the system, we're just gonna destroy the system. Mm -hmm. And that's what was that's kind of what was done. Mm -hmm. you know, but it's we it looks like it looks like we still have it. Um, but I, I think what's actually going on and as I mentioned, I've traveled extensively and um, there is, and I can tell you from having been to 30 countries around the world, more than 30, there is something eating the world. You can see it. You can go around the world, travel for long enough, and you'll see it. It's hard to describe what it is. Whatever that thing is that's eating the world ate America first. And so now it's wearing America like a skin suit. And so while people have this association with America as this like terrible, terrible thing that's devouring the world, and that's not the case at all whatever is devouring the world ate America first and we lost our identity as a nation. And then that's now being exported. Hmm. So eating the world. Oh yes. Eating the world. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so um, the way that I first saw it was through consumerism. So I would go to various countries and I would just see like, you know, piles of plastic trash in, in various natural locations and um, it was uh, it was clear that they were put there by the locals, and uh, it was kind of sad to see the wrappers and stuff like just kind of casually discarded. And of course, we have all the plastic here in the United States as well. Uh, and it was like, 
why why are these cultures being turned into like into into fake fiat food consumerists and what does this have to do with what's going on in the united states and so that was how it first showed up to me is this idea that we are all around the world very slowly being manipulated into consumers and not and not producers consumers of consumers of low cost low quality things um, that again fulfill some amount of sense pleasure rather than any higher virtue or value and so it's like a, a, a substitution that's going on with you see this in architecture and you see it in art and you see it in movies and music you see the gradual dumbing down and lower quality of everything versus the cultivation of things that are of true and enduring we'll say nutrition mentally emotionally physically mm-hmm. spiritually etc mm-hmm. and so this thing that's eating the world is ultimately feeding our baser natures our search for pleasure rather than our, our higher um our higher natures and so that's that's what i mean and it did that to america first and so then it's being exported to the rest mm. of the rest mm. of the world what do you think about is there signs of uh in the art world or in culture world of something of a higher quality manifesting or do you see potentials promises the struggle with art is that um, art is uh, it channels the in, in many ways the spirit of the age. Yeah. So if if someone were to start making Renaissance style paintings, right, we would look at them and say that's really it's aesthetically beautiful and very skilled. But we would wonder naturally what does it have to say to me? What does this have to say about the moment that I'm in? And so I think that there's such, um, there's such grief. Grief is where it begins, but I, I think people feel such grief and such alienation. And beneath that, I think there's anger. I think anger is a legitimate emotional response to a crossed boundary. So when someone crosses one of our boundaries, the way that our body lets us know that happens is through anger. Now we can express it righteously or sinfully, but the Mm. anger itself comes up. And I think we all experience men and women, the notion that something, some boundary is being crossed civilizationally. And so beneath the grief and beneath the alienation and beneath even the depression, there's anger. So how do you produce beautiful art that inspires and that channels the anger? And if you're gonna channel the anger, to whom does the anger go? Where does that energy go? And I think that's probably a challenge that the art world is dealing with right now. And I don't actually have a good answer because you can't channel civilizational anger at a person or even a group of people. That's incredibly destructive. And so if you feel this, what do you do with it? And I I really do believe that the only answer is, is to give it up to God. And so if we see a, a revitalization in the art world, uh, the art world, my hope is that it would be, it produces transcendent pieces of Christian spiritual art that speak to the redemption possible in God to deliver us from our own sin and mistaken ways. So what do we do with that anger? We, we give it up to God, say, God, please help us. Let us create beauty, deliver us from the situation. Because mm-hmm. if you channel that anger towards, again, a person or a group of people or towards yourself, it becomes destructive. And I don't think we need to see any of that. Even though people do it, even though people feel it, I don't think it's wise. Are you asking, are you using the term art world to describe that narrow bit of the world that's consumed with consuming <laughs> stupid pieces well just highly highly overvalued pieces of canvas or are you talking about like media in general are you talking about like just movies and yeah, books the point- and comics and all that stuff yeah i mean i think i think it gets gray where something goes from being art to being um entertainment Right, something that's pure entertainment okay. with no artistic quality to yeah. something that's that's only higher art. I think that's very gray. I'm speaking to all the people that want to that want to create something that speaks to higher virtues and higher values. I would yeah. I would that's what I mean. And whether that shows up in music or or theater or painting, and not the art world in okay. any specific. And are you sense. seeing yeah. that showing up anywhere? Is there anything that has pinged you? Yeah, sort of. I, what I'm seeing. You. Scary I'm movie seeing... four or something like that. <laughs> oh yes, uh, is it Barbie actually? No, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I would say there's a difference between art and aesthetics, and and one of the things that I'm seeing 
that I don't think is entirely bad. You alluded to it earlier with the kind of like dissident right communities that are looking for a new Caesar. But one of the things that they're hyper-focused on is aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a focus on aesthetics is in itself a bad thing. However, aesthetics for the sake of aesthetics becomes self-serving and narcissistic, which is what we see in these in these dissident right kind of communities, men, men especially becoming narcissistic. If you take that aesthetic sense and you give it towards something of a higher virtue, like, like we see this in Greek sculpture, right? It speaks to these higher virtues. You see it in great Renaissance, especially Christian Renaissance art, like Michelangelo's David or the Pieta or whatever. You see these, you see these uh, artistic pieces that speak to higher virtues that are also aesthetic. So aesthetics divorced from higher transcendent, I would say, Christian virtues become self-serving. Um, I'm not seeing that yet probably because there's not a lot of money in it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's very, it's very time consuming to make great art. Like the great art, the great artists of history had patrons that paid for their whole lives. Like you just go ahead and, you know, go ahead and write music, Beethoven. I got this, you know, go ahead and, and paint Mr. Painter. I got this sculpt. We don't have the same level of Christian patronage today. And that's a question that I think a lot of people are grappling with. If that existed, we'd probably see societal change. Why we don't see it, I don't know. Hmm. What about your product, your content that you create? What is, uh, you, you kind of made a nod to a transformation in it, starting with, God, it's a gallery now it's more of like a Christianity. <laughs> um, who are you speaking to and what are you serving? What What is the content that you're pursu pursuing yeah. and what are you finding there in response? My, I started the Renaissance event podcast because I found my way into the manosphere, which we spoke about earlier. And I learned a lot of things about what men do that I didn't previously know. It's like, oh, oh, I didn't know that. This is how men do it. This is what men do. I've also spent time in the mythopoetic men's movement. So I've done men's inner transformation work, coming into proper relationship with emotions and all of that. So I've done a lot of inner and outer work. And I wanted, I started my podcast because I wanted to share that with people. Like, look at this gallery, <laughs> right? And look at all these different men talking about masculinity. But at the same time, I, I, uh, I found Christ, Christ found me, and I got baptized. And as mm -hmm. I began exploring the faith and began reading and started my own sanctification process, my, uh, my understanding of masculinity, my understanding of myself as a man in my own history has changed, has grown, and, and I would say matured. And so as that's happened, my understanding of masculinity and the people that I derive value from in terms of moral instruction and what it means to be a man has changed to become much more Christian. And so my, my content has changed. My podcast has changed with that. And so now I tend to focus on things like the Christian family, like a reconciliation between the sexes. I focus a lot on virtue. I don't talk about like physical fitness. I don't talk about wealth creation very much. There are lots of guys that very ably do those things. I try to focus on higher moral values and virtues and give people tools for how to think about their world so they can create leverage over their own individual lives um, through through right and moral action. So who do I who do I primarily appeal to? My audience now has has changed. It was men. Um, it was men. Uh, 30, 25 to thirty five primarily was my target, mm -hmm. uh, who were either married or about to get married or had had like one young kid. So kind of at that big transition point, like I have to become something different than what I am now to make it to the next far shore. But over time. Uh, my audience has also expanded to be men like 35 to 45 with, uh, with children and families uh, with preteen kids. Mm -hmm. So like, so not a lot of families with teenagers or grown kids, some, mm -hmm. but primarily pre-teenager kids. So men from 25 to 45 or 50 or so, something like that mm -hmm. um, with the aspirationally starting families or have young fa or young ish families. And also a lot of women listen, listen to my podcast as well which I've been very, very blessed by hmm. um, because I, I, I recognize that um, women have their own unique it's challenges. dating opportunities there. <laughs> well, no, not, I mean, like I, I don't, I don't, uh, that's not something that I use it for. I mean, you know, certainly um, that's. <laughs> hey, know. it happened to me. It can happen to anyone. Did it really? Yeah. I married an interviewee. Did you really? Yeah, yeah. Well, I interviewed her in uh, October or November of uh, 2022, and we got married in uh, uh, October of 2023. 
Oh, so. praise God. Really? Did you yeah. know, like, is, that's not why you had her on the interview though. No, no, oh, that, that's say. not why I do this at all. It's not why no. I do this at all. You could do one. <laughs> I, I'm just saying <laughs> if you're open to it, it might happen. Of course. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. <laughs> well, I'm very happy for you. That's great. No, I, I, uh, yeah, that's all I can say about that. But um, can I, can anyway, I ask you like a twofold, twofold question of on course. virtue? Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is virtue. What, what's the best virtue objectively and what's your favorite <laughs> virtue? Uh, virtues. Uh, I like that question. I, I, um, I think of virtues as living in constellation. So uh, a virtue of truth telling, um, divorced from a, a virtue of compassion creates pain. Like, oh, I'm just telling you the truth. Like, yeah, if truth is a truth telling is a virtue, but unless you understand how that truth is going to be received, you have the ability to be compassionate to somebody, you can actually cause them harm. So any one virtue, compassion in isolation from a broader sense of pr perspective can actually be debilitating to somebody. Like, I'm so compassionate for you. It's like, well, you're actually smothering me, right? So we see that as well. So I think of virtues as living in constellation. The virtue that I happen to like the best is, um, is integrity, is making mm. sure that your thoughts and your words and your actions and your beliefs are as in close alignment mm. as they possibly can be. We'll never do that perfectly because, again, we're sinners, but it's an ongoing effort. And I think the lack of integrity is probably the biggest problem facing men today. Mm. So, you know, I, I, we can talk about like what repentance for women looks like and getting them on board. The big, this is how I see it, the big rebellion that men are engaged in is they, they either um, they lie or um, <clears throat> consciously or otherwise, or they don't say anything to begin with because then they're accountable for it. And so they just kind of hide. Like, well, if I put myself out there, then I'm responsible for this thing that I did. And I can't, I'm not responsible. So instead, I'm just going to withdraw from life versus going through the discipline of saying, no, I said that I'm going to do it mm. no matter what, or I made this promise and I'm going to keep it, or I'm telling you what I actually think, letting my yes be yes and my no be no. So integrity is my personal, um, is my personal favorite virtue. And because that's something that I didn't have for many years that I fought, it cost me a lot to get it. It cost me a lot of picking up the phone and calling people and apologizing. Oh yeah. Saying, oh yeah. It was, it was extraordinarily painful. And, um, but it was very necessary and very humbling. And so mm. as a result of that, um, I, I don't want to lose my integrity again, because I remember how hard it was to get it. Huh. Um, and so, yeah. Why did you end up traveling so much? Is it just curiosity that's driving you, adventurous spirit? You had that's extra miles that you inherited from a <laughs> grandfather or something? It was the one thing that I always wanted for myself. Okay. Like, like when I finally, so um, I've, I've told the story before. On uh, Y2K, year 2000, I went to a, a rave here in Phoenix, Arizona. I went with my sister. And uh, I was a totally straight-laced kid. You know, I never did any partying or drinking or anything in, in, in high school. And I got into a really good, really good college. Um, but here's Y2K. And my sister took me to a rave, which was kind of a thing around the time, mm -hmm. and uh, gave me an ecstasy pill. And so, and so I took ecstasy and that was like first time I'd ever really done drugs and had my, you know, brain kind of expanded very powerfully kind of all at once and not entirely in good ways. But I discovered in that moment, a desire to travel that was just kind of like born in me. Hmm. And it was like, this is the first, it was the first thing that I could say for that I wanted for myself that wasn't part of my upbringing or values. It's like, there's something about this that's intrinsically me and I don't fully understand it but I can't shake it either. So it was something that I had wanted for 15 years. And so, um, cir you know, circumstance and effort and, you know, triumph and loss and all those things added up over 15 years to give me the opportunity to travel the way that I always wanted to, which was to backpack solo for uh, a long time. Mm -hmm. So it was a big journey. It's very hard making it across that 15 years, holding on to a dream yeah. for that long. Um, but yeah, it was just part of me. Same way, the same question that you asked earlier, like, um, why do you, why are you so interested in, in pursuing God? Like, I don't know, it's just me. How did you know that the travel days were done or that it was time to sit down? Uh, it's funny. I was just saying this to someone yesterday. Uh, I was in Nepal. I just finished six months in India, backpacking alone in six months through India. It was exhausting. And then I did the Annapurna circuit in Nepal and I was in um, Pokhara, in Nepal and I was in a hostel and I was exhausted. And I, I had always, um, I had always said that there were some ways that I would know if I was done traveling. 
And I was sitting there and I was thinking, what would it take for me to travel to one more country? And I was like, oh, all I can really think of is if I were to go to Italy, I would go to Rome. I would want to fly first class, be literally carried, physically carried through airport security, deposited a five-star luxury resort, and then like deposited at like the Coliseum, which was not how I traveled. Like I was <laughs> staying in hostels and stuff. So I'm like, okay. I'm probably not going to travel first class because it's not what I do. And I'm not going to find anyone to carry me. So I'm probably done. <laughs> right. Mm. So mm. that was how I knew I was exhausted. And when did that end? When did you come back home? That was, uh, that was May of 2019. Okay. So then I, then I, um, there was a woman that I had met in New Zealand uh, and I moved back to New Zealand to try and see if we could have a life together that didn't ultimately work out because our, our visions for life were different. And so then I moved back to the United States in February of 2020, uh, just before mm. COVID really became a thing. And so we mentioned I mentioned earlier that I was reading Simply Christian, quote Simply Christian, quote, right? <laughs> <laughs> and but I was I was carrying this question, this moral question of like, what do I do with the problem of evil? Given that I've seen something is eating the world as well, and so I read this book as COVID is starting to happen, and all the pieces are kind of clicking into place. Okay, and so. Yeah. Hmm. What what is the um where can people find you? And do you is it mostly just podcasts? You also write being a person of the book or of the people of the book? <laughs> uh right now it's just right now it's just my podcast. I'm working yeah. on um I'm working on a course about regret. Uh, oh. because I know yes, I know that what regret, kind of regret just regret in general. Um because I, uh, as I, I mentioned earlier that, um, I, uh, I fought to get back in integrity and, uh, in that I, uh, I had a lot of things in my past that I regretted. And so I believe, um, uh, I believe in the gospel as providing freedom. Uh, and I experienced that. And so one by one, I worked through many things in my life that I had regretted and I came up with my own process for working through regret so I could be free of it. So I could truly finally be free hmm. of regret. Hmm. And so I'm working right now on, I finished writing the first draft of an ebook and an audio book about regret. I'm going to make a video course about it um, as well, because I think regret is something that plagues a great many people, particularly men. Um, and so I wanted to share my process for how I worked through the things that I regretted and hope that maybe we can create a bit more freedom for people. Hmm. It's written from a Christian viewpoint, but I think the, um, yeah. I think the wisdom will help uh, others as well. Are you of a denomination or are you of no denomination? I attend a reformed Baptist church, but, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of, we'll say church governance and denominationally, I would consider myself reformed Presbyterian probably. Okay. Not at like a Greek Orthodox or Catholic mm -mm. or something. Old no, I work definitely very... in the reformed, yeah. definitely in the reformed tradition. We can talk about yeah. denominations too. Oh, uh, no, um, I was just, uh, not, not today. Let's I'm going to have you back Let's on. Go. <laughs> no, please. I don't want to relearn Four what an Episcopalian means. <laughs> I never f remember all these different terms come from like some sort of weird Greek Latin melange. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you like geeky into that? Like the war games of denominations and all the structuring and stuff and all that. I, I, I like went it? into it. Well, I went into it. I really like systematic theology. So yes. Um, mm. But also because I've been, you know, I, I've explored so many world religions. And one of the things that you yeah. have to do in the new age is that you really have to become adept theologically to understand the different practices and beliefs that are being syncretized. So I've always uh. been naturally geared towards theology. And so me being a content creator and having all these followers, I yeah. get men asking me these questions. So I had to work through oh, these okay. questions on my own. Am I intrinsically geeky about it? No, but I've had to answer them for myself. Huh. What are you intrinsically geeky about? I am intrinsically <laughs> geeky about theology, actually. Oh, really? Okay. Is that kind of like yeah. your hobby, your hobby horse kind of? Well, I just, I like, well, I really like understanding subcultures as well. Like okay. I like coming into a new environment full of people, whatever it is, and understanding the different dynamics that makes this group of people tick, whether it's like a, a bowling club or, or a religion or a nation or a group of friends or a business. It's really interesting to me to see yeah. uh, maybe the human mechanics of the shared beliefs and language and values and the history and to kind of understand like, 
what is this thing I found myself in the middle of, which was yeah. really good for traveling because I could go to all these different countries and be like, okay, here I am in India. Well, let me try and understand India or here I am in Japan as best I can in a limited time. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I am kind of geeky about that. You know, there's a certain personality uh, type uh, that inclines one to receive strongly worded letters in whatever domain they find in. It was, <laughs> is a strongly worded letter a, a exception or a rule in your, in your subculture wanderings? Oh man, a strongly worded letter. I mean, you, usually a strongly worded letter in my subculture wanderings is uh, it was the rule and has become the exception. Like, oh, okay, good to, for you. There are ways to handle things without a strongly without a strongly worded. Letter, oh, okay. Let's yeah. say yes. I believe Paul sets out something. You talk with one person, then two, and then the strongly worded letter comes down later on. That's right. That's right. Yes. Good point. Exactly. And so, where can people find you? Go ahead and uh, oh. voice that, and then it'll be linked in the description below. Yeah, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Ren of Men. That's R E N O F M E N, like mm -hmm. Renaissance of Men, but shorter Ren of Men. And you can find Instagram, Twitter, and uh, my podcast at renofmen.com slash links. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can subscribe to my podcast from there, and you'll be hearing about that regret course hopefully mm -hmm. pretty soon. Do you have any merch or, or comic book? <laughs> I don't. I, no. have a, I have a t shirt. I, I did a, I put out a t shirt. I can put a link to that in the, in the link tree. So renofmen.com slash links. Okay. So you can find my okay, t-shirt Yeah, there. Yeah, that, that'll be a nice little bundle. Yeah. Mr. Spencer, thank you very much for uh, accepting the invitation to my show. I think, I don't know. If, is somebody knocking? I'm recording a show. I'll be right out in just five minutes. Is that okay? Uh, no, somebody, she's actually installing a, a letter. Anyway, sorry about that. No problem. It's a, it's a living household that I have now. Um, <laughs> I was wrapping up. I had like this whole thing. I was saying it and then somebody was knocking on the wall. You're saying thank you for joining you on your show. Yeah, you 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 had to pop your mouth off about the culture of abuse and uh uh sketchiness in India, which is oh, a whole yeah. other story. I'm like, "Oh, this mm. is an interesting guy." Uh, you went a little viral. I think you went a little viral for that. 22 period. 23 million views on that tweet. 60,000 oh. likes. Yeah, it was like, it was in, it was incredible. I went to bed on Sunday night. It had fifty thousand. I woke up in the morning to a text message from a friend that had one point five million views, and then I watched it go from like one point five to seven million in the course huh. of like four hours. And by the time the thing finally wound down, it had twenty three yeah. million views, and I had doubled my followers from like thirteen thousand to twenty six thousand followers go. overnight. It's a little wild. silver lining. Yeah, yeah. Do, are you proud of that particular tweet going viral? And I'll link it in the description for anybody's curious about it. It's just yeah. a, a nice little biographical window into a phenomenon of uh, tourists getting uh, abused and disabused of their resources when visiting India. Yeah, I had previously written uh, another tweet that went very viral about India versus Japan versus America. So I had yeah. made a similar a similar comparisons. But yeah, I was quite proud of that. Uh, quite proud of that tweet. It's it is by the way it's really a thing to watch something go viral like that because there's nothing like you can't write something that'll be seen by 23 million people. Like no one thinks that way. This is going to be seen by 23 million people. Yeah. And so when you get 23 million people looking at something, they're going to be able, everyone's going to be able to find some way to tear it apart. So like, so to, to just kind of put something together that re represented my thoughts accurately and then to see everyone see it and then to see the responses to it, which were in, somewhere incredibly positive. Many people, especially inside and, and, and men, people, men and women who had both left India were like, you're dead on. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right about this. Mm -hmm. And then there were a lot of people within India that were quite angry about it. And yeah. I, did you I awaken the India Twitter? Because they have yes. their own culture. Yeah. Yeah. The Bharat, Bharat B-H-A-R-A-T, Indian uh, Hindu nationalism. They're, they're, um, I understand the love for their country. They have a very fierce and passionate love for their country. And having been there, I understand it completely. And it's really important for anyone who becomes nationalistic um, of any nation to not be blind to a nation's flaws. In the mm -hmm. same way that we as men and as women, if we have, um, we'll say, a, a form of healthy pride in ourselves, that the only way that we can carry that healthy pride is also with a sense of humility, being very, uh, being very aware of our flaws. And so um, a lot of nationalism around the world tends to blind itself to a country's flaws because it doesn't have a system to integrate it. America, of course, as well. And so as mm -hmm. much as I understand the Hindu nationalists love for their country, and, and there are many things about the country I love, they're tragically blind about um, India's flaws, as are many American nationalists. So it's not a new, it's not an explicitly Indian mm -hmm. phenomenon. It's just something that happens in the human psyche, I guess. 
we should wrap it up, but I, I really no, I just have go. all these questions. Like what, which, uh, if, if you were to, um, try to sell womanhood, um, to, to women, um, American womanhood, Japanese womanhood, uh, India womanhood, which, which one is your, uh, which one do you think is the best womanhood and why? This is a terrible question. Like I just, this is like, here's something that you want to get torn (laughs) apart by all of your female followers and mine answer this question. (laughs) I don't know that I could say that there's, I don't know in my travels that there's a giant difference between, I mean, is the, is the respect afforded women different in these three countries? How is it different in these three countries and why is it different in these three countries? Oh yeah. So, um, if we're, if we're making, um, if we're making historical comparisons, because I think we have to make historical cultural comparisons, um, the the traditional role, the traditional Christian role of of women in America has been a position of great honor. It's been a, it's a, it, though it doesn't seem like it because we live in a world that values economic and historical achievement. Like, did you get your name in the record books? Did you earn seven figures? You know, did you get the advanced degrees? That's what's been foisted upon us. By a heavily commercialized, you know, uh, uh, crony capitalism kind of environment that devalues the home, that devalues the household. It was previously understood that the value of the household was incalculable. That the household, that the home, the family was worth defending, even with one's own life, because of the virtue that this is, as Pastor Toby Sumter says, this is where human lives are created. This is where they come into being. This is the place where the next generation of great artists and thinkers, this is, this is where they begin being nurtured and come into existence. And that that home, that place, that nuclear reactor for beauty should be protected even up to and including the husband's life. And we've lost any sense of the home, the house of that nurturing being valuable because we're so obsessed with the market. We have to get out into the marketplace. We have to get money. We have to get power. And it dishonors the value of the home. Hmm. Previously, this is the, the best of womanhood is to recognize the glory and, and the beauty and the intimacy and the tenderness that exists in the creation and nurturing of human life. And just how much, how much men are willing to give their lives for that. That's why we say women and children first. We recognize that a man's life is dispensable compared to the life of his wife and his children, that they are so much more important than he is. We've lost that sense. So I don't know that I could say, you know, in a, in a very strong way, you know, historically, whether um, womanhood in the United States or India or Japan, like the true contours, but I can tell you that that picture is given to us by scripture, by the, by the image that it paints of, of a husband and wife, particularly in Ephesians and other places as well, that Christ has a bride. Christ is the God man. He's getting married. He's getting married to his church, just how glorious that is. And so that's unique to the West. And so you have other cultures in, in around the world um, that, re- that do genu- generally, genuinely regard women as property, as tools. And that is not the picture of scripture. Mm-hmm. And we've gotten, we've gotten away from that. So what's the, what's the sell point? The sell point is a level of, of beauty and honor and intimacy and value and virtue that transcends anything achievable in the marketplace. Really, like I'm sure that there's probably a woman listening, you know, who's, who's achieved, you know, a vice president or CEO or chairman of the board kind of status and ultimately found it to be emotionally empty as men do, right? It's not like it's, you know, mm. found it to be very, very dry. And because that's war, that's wartime. War is emotionally dry. The market is warfare. Like World War One, you see guys, you know, hacking it out in the trenches. That's the highest level of corporate America. That's what that is, right? And mm. so the idea that that's something to be celebrated, you know, at the expense of a, of a, of a woman's childbearing potential, ultimately she will discover that she's given her life to war and sacrificed in that the intimacy and warmth of the home. Traditionally, men were the ones who gave their lives in war to protect women being in the home. And we've, inf- we've inverted that. And so now we have stay-at-home dads, and we have wives going out to warfare, and it dishonors the design for both men and women. And it leaves us both unfulfilled societally, and society are, falls apart as a result. Are men at fault? Uh, in this beyond, uh, you know, the ravages of the birth control abortion stuff and female empowerment and stuff like that are, are men holding up 
the standard by which women can bear bearing their offspring. It's it, it, like the question of fault is a really tricky one because um, fault implies uh, like a unilateral fault. And I am not of the opinion that it is any, any uh, either men or women's unilateral fault. I think that there's more than enough responsibility and blame to go around. Um, well, what, what do men need to do to be worthy of the honor of a woman's dedication in, in that way? Um, and are they doing that? Well, a man is called um, to be able to uh, uh, protect, provide for, and be, in a sense, a, a priest to represent God to his household, hmm. right? So a, a man should be able to uh, support himself um, or be in the direction and in terms of his career of being able to support himself support and support a family um, and to be able to physically, so that's the provide component, and to be able to physically protect from threats right? That might mean a fire. I've got to carry you out in the middle of the night. Okay. I've got to lift this up, you know, right? It doesn't necessarily have to do this. This is where you read. sneak the second amendment into your theology, isn't it? <laughs> That's, I mean, there's a, <laughs> it's relevant. It's certainly relevant, but like if, but like there are plenty of guys that can't run a 20 yard dash, but carry firearms. And it's like, maybe you're putting the cart before the horse, right? So mm, it's like, mm -hmm. right. Be able to be able mm. to run and, and lift and, and, you know, and you have to be able to sprint, like if you have to be able to sprint and carry your children to safety, your firearm is useless. It's like, but there's there are... like a presidential fitness test for, for marriage eligibility that I, I hear in the background here. Is this like the second course after regret? It's like <laughs> leg day or something like that. Yeah. I mean, maybe, I mean, I, I, the thing is, is like, you're asking, what does a man need to do to be worthy? Yeah. Right. So we can enforce this from a governmental level or we can say like, well, what, what would a woman be looking for? It's like, well, I would like a man to be able to provide for me. And that can look all different ways depending on, depending on the woman, but that's a, that's a basic thing to be able to provide. He must be able to protect, meaning like I should be safer being around him. Right. And from a scriptural perspective, he should be able to read and interpret the word of God to his family to bring them up in terms of moral virtue. And so what must a man do to be able to yeah. earn, quote unquote, earn a woman in that way? Those are those are good places to start. And if a man can do those three things, he can provide for a family. You don't have to do the, you know, the 2.5 children and 3.5, you know, two door you know, or two, two car garage. You don't have to do that. But to be able to support yourself and others and to be able to protect and to be able to disciple them in moral virtue, if a man can do those three things, hmm. I think he's put himself in a pretty good position. But that's what men resist. They like that's that's what they resist, particularly the moral virtue, because it's very hard to disciple people in integrity if you yourself are not a person of integrity. If you're not if you're not a man of integrity, and hmm. so that's that's the component where the manosphere fell down, is that it, it could teach men how to be protectors. It could teach them how to be physically fit. It could teach them even how to be good providers, but it couldn't disciple men in moral virtue because the men of the manosphere and the red pill were not men of moral virtue as we are discovering, right? And you need that third component or again, it still doesn't work. Hmm. Where, where are these men of moral virtue? Are they represented um, online somewhere? Are they represented in films and in books and movies? Not today. Okay. Not in, not in film. Like one of the things that's consistently happened in, and particularly in Hollywood, is taking characters that were once of moral virtue and uh, and Inverting diminishing them. them. Yeah. Like you see this with- Or lifting up the villain, yeah, and then uh, complicating or deconstructing the hero. Yes, exactly, the deconstruction. So whether it be Luke Skywalker, you know, abandoning his Jedi path and becoming bitter on some planet somewhere, or Han Solo being a deadbeat dad, or James Bond being a being, you know, being shown to be a, a pig or whatever, or even the Terminator being he's into drapes or something like that. If you remember one of the recent Terminator movies, uh, there's just a one, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, he 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 gets married to a woman and becomes like a a draper, like literally a draper. It's like of all the things. So <laughs> there's a subversion of the hero. There's a subversion of the masculine role that's happening in our movie, so that we're being deprived the image. Of virtuous masculinity we're being we're not being shown it so it doesn't exist our, in our imaginations mm -hmm. because uh, there's a mimetic function to our minds if we can't see something that we can't imitate it so hmm. where are where are those men and that is a that is a great question one of the things that i and, and many others in my faith are uh doing is discipling a man within um, the christian church 
to be men of moral to be to be these kinds of men. Now the challenge that the public faces, the the non-Christian public faces, is there can be men of of, of the ability to protect and provide, but they are not men of moral virtue. Right. So there's that problem. But you also have within the church, you have men who are of moral virtue, but they're not able to protect and provide. And so my personal hmm. perspective is that it's easier to take a man of moral virtue and teach him how to be a protector and provider than it is to take a protector and provider and give him moral virtue. Like it's, it's, it's easier to go one way than the other. And so me and, and, mm. and myself and many others are discipling men in becoming better protectors and providers and preserving their moral virtue at the same time. So it's a slower process, but it's what bears durable fruit. Hmm. Um, and I really recommend the account, uh, my friend, Nate Spearing, um, at the Spearing on Twitter. He's a great example. He inspires me regularly. As he's your friend. Moral, he's my friend. Yeah. Yeah. He's been, a, yeah, but he didn't start as my friend. He's become my friend, but. Oh yeah. Did, did your relationship begin with the strongly worded letter and then like it softened <laughs> over time? He did the reverse <laughs> manosphere thing. <laughs> Thankfully he's not part of the manosphere, but you know, he just, he's a former, um, he's a former uh, army ranger, a re- elite level army ranger. Yeah. And, uh, and we just were creating content on Instagram and had podcasts and started talking. Oh, and fun. I think, I think we, uh, we recognized something um, in each other, which is as when men become friends, that's what happens It's like, you know, men look at each other and say, there's something in you that I recognize. And they say mm. the same and a friendship grows from that. So that's what, um, that's what sort of came of that. And he's a, again, he's an elite level army ranger retired. And now he's a general contractor, has a family of like five kids. And wow. he's been very successful creating uh, content online as well. Very devout Christian husband and father. And he's an excellent example. There are many, but he's an excellent example of the kind of man that's discipling men towards not just being a good protector and a good provider, but a man of moral virtue as well. So you say, where are these men? Men like me and Nate and many others yeah. are are working to create them. Yeah, yeah. They're around. I mean, it, you know, some They're of my at- questions <laughs> sound like I'm being an idiot or, or, or being accusatory, but I, I, no, I throw I the ball to see how somebody catches it and throws it back, you know, so... Oh no, I totally get it. Like uh they're they're I can give you the exact zip code where they're all all the guys are hanging oh. out. <laughs> oh no, don't let the FBI know that because uh they'll uh construe you guys a bunch of Patriot uh Patriot front members, you know. We don't the, wear masks. We actually wear khakis. Do you wear khakis? Oh, I don't wear khakis. No, you don't. No. Okay, I was gonna say because no. it seemed because you're buttoned up. I'm like, are there khakis down there? But we don't need to I'm go. I'm wearing there. fatigues. No. There is something to be said though for, for men who who I, I like as you can tell, I'm not anonymous. I use my real name yes. and my real face. Yeah. And I think that there is something to that because again, the manosphere and the red pill, they, there were men that would use their real face, but they would be pseudonymous, meaning they were using yeah. fake names. Right. And, or there were men, plenty of men, particularly on, uh, on Reddit, you know, when uh, the, the red pill Reddit who were anonymous, you don't know their, you don't know their face. You don't know their name, just their voice. Right. And mm. I think that there needs to be a shift like, no, this is my real face. This is my real name. And I'm accountable for the things that I say. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's really important. So to your Patriot front, you know, kind of thing, it's like, no, there's no, there's no, no. ski masks here. There's no sunglasses here. There's no balaclavas here. Right. Well, the problem with accountability is accountable to whom that's the, sure. that's the one refuge of anonymous people. It's like, well, I'm, I'm not going to be accountable to the people who are controlling everything. So I'm going to use anonymous an anonymity, but it's got a ceiling because then you, you have no, it significantly diminishes your skin in the game. Yes. Well, what happens is an anonymity lets people explore what we might call the frontiers of ideas mm. and say really extreme things, right? And those really extreme things, the reason why those extreme things aren't generally said is that for better or worse, there are consequences for saying them. Now, there are some ways in which consequences for speaking truth is bad. And and we recognize this, you know, Christ was crucified for preaching the truth to the Pharisees, Mm. right? So, So there's a way in which censorship is bad, but there are also things that we can say that are destructive and we don't say them because we recognize it causes chaos. And men who are anonymous can say these chaotic things divorced from any consequences until they get found out. And then they can be manipulated with their identity. So they actually become more dangerous, Hmm. right? And that's what the thing that I think people don't see is that many anonymous creators, 
it's, you know, if, if someone really gets into open source Intel, you can probably find the identities of a lot of anonymous creators. You have no idea who they are. You have no idea who's running them. You have no idea. They build these giant platforms, hundreds of thousands, potentially sometimes even millions of followers. And you don't know who they are. You don't know who's influencing them. You don't know who's saying like, hey, you need to say this on your channel now, or I'm going to dox your identity. Like hmm. you don't know that. And so there's a real danger to anonymous anonymous creators, which is why I've, I've always been a staunch advocate. This is my name. This is my face. I'm accountable for the things that I say. Mm -hmm. I'm accountable for my integrity so that I only say things that I can stand behind. Like we all stumble over our words and we all fish for ideas. Like I want to, you know, I want to reach and grab something. And there's that component, right? Yeah, that's but my brand. Gonna... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's part of doing a podcast. Yeah. Like I can't articulate the perfect thought every time, but at the same time, I know that, you know, I have to say things that, that I get to then own. Yeah. Yeah. Will Spencer, going to wrap it up now. No, you're not. You were, it was really good. You, you were really clever about how you, how you got out of comparing <laughs> Japanese Indian and American women. Good on you. I, I don't, can, don't I mean, go there. Don't do it. I can try. Oh, really? I mean, yeah. I mean, look, okay. So, so here's, here's my limit. Okay. Here's my limited understanding. Again, I'm not Indian, right? So I see Indian culture from the outside, right? But you, you have a definite, you have a definite culture of open disrespect of women. You see an open, open culture of uh, violence, acceptable kinds of violence. And we're not even talking like some of the, like, I, I won't even talk about the displays of, of Muslim culture that I saw. So like, we'll just, just uh, go explicitly with, with India. And you see these, there are so many stories of particularly Western female travelers going over being horrifically abused, decapitated, right? And it's just a level of savage violence towards women that's insane, that's indicative of a, of a couple different things, right? Now, again, violence against women is a, is a worldwide phenomenon. I don't mean to say it's isolated to any one region or any one, or any one country, Right. But when you, the, I think what really tripped people off was that I, I came to a position of valuing women through scripture, through, through, um, through Christianity, that Christianity commands, God commands you to relate to women in a particular way, which is to love them. Like husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's what it commands to husbands. And Christ died for the church. Right? So abuse of women in a Christian marriage is an abuse of authority. God delegated authority. You are no longer fit to have authority, right? Yeah, I'm so sorry about this. Yeah, but freaking hey, man. <laughs> Stuff is so dumb. You're going to have Wait. a fun time cutting all this together. I know. You're giving me so much work. That's why I want to end the conversation. Okay. So I don't have to edit I'll, anymore. <laughs> I'll, I'll wrap it up quickly. So, so in um, Japan. Yes. So Japan is, Japan is harder because Japan has a, a far more secretive culture, right? It's, it's a crossover between private and secretive, meaning that like, there's a way in which Japanese culture is inscrutable to outsiders, right? Because it, it's so, uh, one of the things I heard from uh, a, 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 someone who was born in Japan is that in America, we're used to hosting people in our homes. Like, oh, just come over and hang out. And what this person said is like, that almost never happens in Japan because people are so secretive about their homes. They just don't entertain the same way, the same way we do, right? So, so there's a way in which the actual dynamics are much more difficult to kind of see what's actually going on behind the scenes, right? So if you look at Japan as a culture, it's very safe, it's very clean, it's very quiet for, for, for everybody. But I don't think that necessarily results in the same kind of uh, biblical picture that we'll be looking at. Now, from what I could see, Asian cultures to me appear a little bit like a matriarchy, meaning that you live out there in the world and it seems very male dominated. But when you get into the home, the, the woman, the wife or the grandmother is the one who actually like leads the home. And it might not always be a good thing. Now, again, I can't see this because it's off limits to me as, as Gaijin, right? Mm -hmm. um, but my, my kind of understanding is that the way things manifest out there in the world, once you get into the home, which again, as we talked about, is of such a primary importance, right? Things look very, very different, right? And it's not from a position of honoring. It's from a position of perhaps a position of even fear or domination, but in an inverted kind of way versus America, a lot of things are very on the surface about the way we do things. We're very open people and scripture paints a picture of 
this is God, this is Christ, this is man, this is woman, this is children, in this organization as commanded of responsible authority within scripture. And that doesn't exist in other, con- in other cultures. And so when it doesn't exist in other cultures, it goes wrong in various ways, right? It goes wrong even in cultures that do have it, but at least we have this standard that we can adhere to. And that's what I think set people off is this notion like there is an objective standard that works better when we follow it and different cultures fall, fall off that in, in different ways that are counterproductive to society. Hmm. Are you ever going to run for uh, political placement? <laughs> I have no intention of ever running for office. No. If, yeah. if, if someone should come what to about me. pastoring? You're going to do a ministry, you think? That seems, that seems likely that at some point, like I'll, you know, yeah. go to seminary and, and become a pastor, but I don't, that's not my, my current plans, but that seems yeah, po- so very likely. In your future. Mm-hmm. Can I ask like what decade you were originate from? Like born in? Yes. In the seventies. Oh, Generation okay. X. Oh, really? Okay. Mm-hmm. What year? 78. Oh, okay. You're still, you're still younger than me then. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. I still have, I still have a precedence over you in the hierarchy of <laughs> podcasters. Bros exactly. with shows. <laughs> Bros yeah. with shows. Yeah. <laughs> you've done, you've done very well. Like your, your channel is very successful. Congratulations. I'm working on it. Yeah. It's always a, it's a, it's constant, um, constant content is the law of the land. That's right. Um, any recommended reading? I guess you said simply Christianity uh-huh. and merely or no, mere. Mere Christianity. Not merely Christianity. Mere Christianity. Lewis went out. <laughs> merely merely. Christianity, yes. <laughs> the, the Space Trilogy by C.S. Lewis is another good yeah, one. Yeah. Um, I just picked up this book, uh, The Book That Made Your World by Vishal Mangalwadi. And so oh. he's an Indian He's an Indian professor. And so he, um, he talks about how the Bible has inspired Western culture in a way that it didn't around uh, that in the way that it didn't around the world and sort of um, some of the consequences of that. Mm. So um, it's, I'm looking forward to reading that. And uh, I like no mere mortals by Toby Sumter. It's another really good one about. Oh, a, you've mentioned this pastor Toby guy several times. Mm, he's great. Yeah. So he, uh, this is a beautiful book about uh, a picture of the biblical family, like biblical, biblical picture of the family. And he -hmm. writes very movingly and very, and uh, very clearly um, about questions. Like you mentioned, like autonomy and authority and headship and, you know, submission and all of these different topics. He writes competency and competence. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's a good one. And uh, I recommend father hunger by uh, pastor Doug Wilson. That's another really good one about the epidemic of fatherlessness in our culture. Mm. And I'm trying to think of a really good book, um, a really good book about Christian masculinity. Probably the best book about Christian masculinity is It's Good to Be a Man by Michael Foster. Um, And Michael Foster uh, talks about gravitas uh, as the central ability, uh, the central ability of a man to draw people into his orbit. Right. Mm. And that comes, you know, from integrity. He does. I don't know if he talks about it quite the same way, but gravitas is necessary. Men need to develop gravitas because through gravitas, you hold people, particularly a household in your orbit. Leadership mm. as well is all driven by gravitas. So it's good to be a man. Mm. It's probably a good place to start. Gravitas. Mm. Yes. That could be a great podcast, but it'd be so heavy and deep. <laughs> yes. Welcome to gravitas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have to have a really gravelly voice to uh, introduce it. Just pitch it down. Yeah. The guy who, the guy who did the intro to my pod, my podcast has a, a super deep voice. When you listen, I used to be very long, but I cut it down. You, you, you are the Renaissance. Very deep. I can't even get there. <laughs> you did it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, cool. Thank you so much, Will. I'm going to wrap up the recording. Thank you very much for um, sharing your life and your knowledge with me. I will definitely have you back on again. Lovely. And we'll uh, channel people to your channels uh, via the links below. Thank you so much, Benjamin. This has been great. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. My pleasure.